Learn how to effectively use automation to streamline your tasks, both for business and personally. Popular creator and FreeCodeCamp.org team member Anya Kubo created this course. It covers a bunch of use cases and examples, including AI-enhanced email automation, automating task management, automating lead management, and way more. You'll do it all with Make, who provided a grant to make this course possible. Have you ever wanted to learn how to automate tasks in your business so that you can free up time to take on the bigger challenges? My name is Anya Kubo and I'm a software developer as well as course creator here on FreeCodeCamp as well as on my own channel and I'm going to be your guide today into learning all about automation and how to do so. Now, usually you might see coding tutorials from me, but this course is for everyone, meaning that no code will be required. This makes this course perfect for anyone from founders, marketers, sales reps or operational gurus. I'll be showing you how to make automation pipelines, ranging from simple to advanced. We will also have all of these application integrations to our disposal. So, as you can see, there's a lot. And if you have your own app, you can also hook it up as well. For the purpose of this course, we will focus on a variety of verticals to try to cover as many interests of viewers as possible. In fact, here's a breakdown of what we will be building in this course. So first off, I'm just going to start with an introduction in which I'm going to introduce you to make.com, which is where the no-code automation tool that we will be using lives. After getting to grips with it through a short tutorial, I will then move on into talking about lead management automation. In this section, I will start off with a use case for this automation so that you can get to grips with what you can do with it. After understanding how lead management automation can be useful for you or your company, I will then go into building our first automation pipeline, which is a basic one that will essentially take your Facebook leads from a Facebook advert and put them into a Google Sheet for you. Next, we will move on to a more advanced automation pipeline in which we will collect contacts that have come to you from a form on your company website. We will then take the lead's email, analyze the domain it came from through a company called Clearbit, which will give us information about the domain name. So for example, if bobby at google.com is messaging you from his work email, we know that he works at Google. And Clearbit will allow us to get all this information about Google that will be useful to us. After getting this information, we will move on to put this in a CRM system and filter it based on the cloud score of the company itself. And as a bonus, we'll send a message to Slack to all our colleagues to let us know that a new lead has come in. After that, we will move on to look at e-commerce automation, starting off once again with a use case for this and leading into building an automation pipeline. This one will take on the premise of you being a property company and having loads and loads of properties in a Google Sheet and using ChatGPT to essentially create a description of all of your properties that you can use online. We will also add extra information about the property and its whereabouts thanks to providing the exact location of the property so that we can also include familiar landmarks and metro stations in the vicinity. Next, we will look at a ticketing and barcode automation, which will use the barcode app from make.com so that you can essentially, once again, use a Google spreadsheet of all the tickets that you sold and generate individual barcodes for them, which we will then stick into a template made on Google Docs so you can automatically create a unique ticket with a barcode for all of your ticket purchases. After this, we will move on to an in-house automation. So far, we've been creating automations that help us either get new clients or work with existing clients outside of our company. Well, I'm going to show you how to create an automation that will help you deal with the admin internally too. So for this example, I'm going to show you how you can automatically create Google Calendar events from Trello, as well as go into a use case for why this might be useful. And finally, we will end with an automation that delves more into AI. This is a fantastic one. I don't want to reveal too much, but essentially it's going to use ChatGPT, or in other words, the OpenAI API, in order to produce unique and very real responses to emails of a certain category. 
okay? So make sure to stay tuned for that one at the end. We will be doing so using mate.com as our no-code automation tool in order to build out our automation pipelines. To follow along with this tutorial, you can use the link in the video description below to create a make.com account with a higher level of access than normal. Just go ahead and click on it now and let's get going. So what are we waiting for? Let's do it. First off, I'm going to show you how to get started with the automation tool that we'll be using today. Okay, so we're going to start off on the make.com website and we're going to get started for free. So just go ahead and click here. You won't be asked for any payment. And I'm just going to choose to sign up with Google. You can, of course, choose to sign up however you wish. There's an option to sign in with Facebook, GitHub, and of course, just using your name and email. So there you go. Just choose the one you prefer. Agree to the terms of service. This part is optional. You can choose to sign up to notifications and emails if you wish about the latest. And I'm just going to sign up for free after checking that I am not a robot. And there we go. So great, first off, I'm just gonna select the role which best describes me. I'm gonna choose development and engineering. And then what do I want to automate? Well, we're gonna be automating a bunch of things. However, we are gonna start with lead management first. So I'm just gonna select that one. And let's start with having no experience at all. The company size is just me. And then I'm just gonna select YouTube as the way I heard this and great. So now let's get started. So here we are, we are now on the dashboard that's going to allow us to create a lot of scenarios in regards to automations and allow us to run them. You can, of course, upgrade if you wish. Our current plan is the free plan. It will just allow us to have more operations, build more apps, have an unlimited number of scenarios, 40 minutes of scenario execution time. We can also increase the file size that we work with and then also have access to 300 API endpoints as well. It's only $9 a month, so please go ahead and sign up to that one if you want, or you even have the pro version, which elaborates on the plan before, as was the team version, also enterprise version as well. So those are the options you have. Like I said, we are going to be working with the free package. Don't worry, we won't go over the maximum amount of active scenarios that we're going to build. Great. So let's go back. We currently have no active scenarios. However, we are going to build them out and we're going to do so soon. We are also able to create a team. So I'm not going to be doing this for this tutorial, but when you grow your organization so that, you know, you add more team members, you would create a team first and then you can also add users to that. So like I said, I'm the only user here at the moment. You can invite other users to your organization, but that is something that we will not be doing in this course. Wonderful. Let's continue now. Let's create our first scenario. And to do that, we can actually click this button right here. And here we are. We are now ready to create our first scenario. When working for yourself or a small to medium sized business, automating the first interaction to a potential customer or client can be a huge resource saver. By this, I imagine Stella and her team are looking to spread the word about a new tool that is useful to software developers. She advertises on Facebook or LinkedIn to collect leads to see who is actually interested in the tool. Stella can then automate a message or even a custom message if she wants to the hundreds and hundreds of leads or even have ChatGPT write them for her. This would happen in seconds as opposed to days if she chose to type out the messages herself. And not only that, she can automate the admin for organizing these companies within our company too. Whether she is using Google Sheets or a CRM like HubSpot, there is so, so much more she can do. I'm going to show you a few of these things now. Okay, so let's get building. Facebook leads ads are one of the most popular and important ad products that companies can lean on today. By leveraging the mobile friendliness and advanced targeting features Facebook leads ads provide, both small businesses and large companies can connect with their audiences to give them the information they want and generate qualified leads all at once. 
Facebook leads are caught through forms. So form submissions on Facebook. And in order to get those, we're gonna have to actually create that form on Facebook through their ads account with an active campaign driving our audience to the lead forms. Let's have a go at doing that now. So all I'm gonna do is head over to the ads account, so ads manager account for my business account. It should be under the URL adsmanager.facebook.com ads manager. Okay, and if you hit enter, it should take you to the full thing. Now I'm just gonna create a campaign and it's gonna be for leads and I'm just gonna click continue. Okay, so here we go, we have a new leads campaign. I can choose what this will advertise. As I run codewithanya.com, I'm selling courses on there. So I'm gonna go with employment as my course will help you get employed as a software developer. The country I've chosen is United Kingdom and you can choose to add all these things. I'm just gonna keep it super basic for now and click next. Great. We want to generate leads by asking people to fill in a form using instant forms. So that is the option that I'm going to choose. Make sure to agree to the terms and conditions just like so. And once you've accepted the meta leads ads terms for this page, you should be good to go. Great. I'm going to maximize for number of leads. These are all optionals. So I'm just going to also set a budget and schedule like so. I'm not gonna set an end date. Again, these are all up to you. I'm just gonna leave everything very basic like this. Wonderful. Now you must select an Instagram page for this to work on. I'm just gonna choose my Instagram account. and I'm gonna choose a template for us to work with as once again, I'm just gonna keep this very, very basic. So we're just going to collect quick and easy information, including the contact information of the person, so the full name, the email address, and the phone number, so that we can contact them. You can customize it if you wish. So for example, maybe let's change the full name to code with Anya Leads and the form type you can also customize your form depending on the goal of your lead generation campaign again we are not doing a facebook tutorial so i'm just gonna keep this very basic and create the form and then we're also gonna get a link it's gonna be to codewithania.com this is because a privacy policy exists on codewithania.com okay so if you go to the actual website and scroll down, you will see a bunch of legal stuff right here. So make sure to have that too. Great. We're also going to have to add a link here. This is simply to my website. So the call to action is to view the website as well. And this is after our form is submitted. So let's create the form. Wonderful. Another thing we can do is just change the visuals on this, which might be a nice thing to do. So let's go ahead and add some media. I'm going to add an image. Let's go with this one right here and click next. Okay, great. So now this is what my ad will look like visually as well. Of course, the aim is to collect leads, but this is just some more information about what your business does. So for example, we have code with Anya and then we have learn coding. So what my business can do for you as well as a testimonial for some social proofing as well. We can also add some primary text. So for example, I could put learn to code today, sign up for more information in order to really push getting those leads. And then we can have something like coding, is the future okay i haven't put much thought into this of course please do have a lot more of a marketing strategy when creating your own okay great so this is looking good i can also choose to review the advert this will take you to a form on Facebook, which is exactly what we want. We want the form to be filled out and captured by Facebook, which we will then learn to manage elsewhere soon. 
but this is looking good for me, so I'm just going to hit on publish. And wonderful, that is now publishing my advert, my form capture advert. And that's now been published. It is currently processing, so we're going to have to check back to see what this looks like soon. For now, let's continue making our scenario. So now, as you can see here, I'm going to go back to make.com and let's continue. So the first thing I'm going to do is choose a trigger that will kick off our scenario. That trigger is going to be the Facebook lead. Next, we're going to choose an action that will follow after the trigger. And then following that, we're going to decide where we want our Facebook leads to go to. I'm going to choose a Google spreadsheet. And then we'll test our scenario and choose to activate it if we wish. So let's do it. So I'm just going to click here and then we're going to search for Facebook just like so and we're going to select Facebook leads ads. Okay, and we're going to set the trigger as being a new lead. So it will trigger when a new lead is created. Great. Now we're going to create a webhook. So we're just going to click on create webhook and we can keep it as it is or you can change it if you wish. And we're going to create a connection. So that is now making a connection from my Facebook to make. This may take a while because some partners may take a while to reflect this change. So let's go ahead and click save. And then this should take me to this pop up. You might have to allow pop ups if you're not seeing this. And I'm going to continue as Anya. So my Facebook login, as you saw, we're already logged into Facebook, which is why this is showing up as so. And I'm going to allow access to be made from make to Facebook. Great. So now that's waiting for authorization and wonderful. I'm now going to select the page I want to connect to and it is code with Anya. So that is looking good. The form it is code with Anya leads as we named it in the ads manager. And I'm just going to click save. Great. I'm actually going to go ahead and select all the fields like so and click OK. Great. So our trigger is now chosen. Let's continue. So now I'm just going to head over to Facebook and we just need to allow access to people. So I'm going to select on myself and all I'm going to do is essentially select the pages and I'm going to allow myself access to manage leads, including download leads and create leads ads and more and save. So just make sure to essentially do the same. Okay. Wonderful. So once that is done, let's go back in here and now I'm just going to run this and the scenario run was complete. So some data has come back. We now need to put it in a Google sheet. So let's go ahead and find Google sheets. I'm just going to select that module and we want to essentially add a row. So I'm just going to drag that over and connect it and create a connection. I'm going to leave this as my Google connection. Of course, you can call it whatever you wish. And I'm just going to sign in with Google so that we can connect to Google Sheets. I'm, of course, going to select Anya at codewithanya.com as that is the Google account that I want to give access to make to. And once again, I'm allowing make to see, edit, create and delete all my Google Drive files, as well as see and edit, create and delete all my Google Sheets spreadsheets. So just go ahead and do the same if you're, of course, comfortable with that. So I'm going to click allow and great. We've created a connection. Now we need to actually go ahead and create that Google Sheet. So let's go ahead and go to Google Sheets. And all I'm going to do is essentially create a blank spreadsheet. So let's go ahead and click here. And then I'm just going to name this something. Let's go ahead and call this Facebook leads. You can call it whatever you want. And we also need to name the sheet as we will be picking that out. So I've named it leads. And then we're going to choose the method to be the same and the drive. Well, it's going to be my drive. And here I'm just going to find that spreadsheet. So let's go ahead and search for Facebook leads and of course, select the sheet. So the sheet name will be generated for you. We only have one. So let's go ahead and select leads just like we have named it here. So there we go. I'm going to keep table headers as no, as we don't have any and the column range. I'm just going to go A to Z as we won't have many. And here we're just going to pick out everything from the object that we want. Because we ran this once, the object does have some values. So this is great for us as we know what's coming back. 
So I'm going to go ahead and select a few. Of course, we should probably have the lead ID. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. I'm going to also select the form ID. Uh, I'm also going to select the full name of the person who has emailed in as well as the email. And we can have whatever we want. As I said, I'm just going to stick phone number in there too. And let's go ahead and choose is organic. That's another one that I want. And let's have the ad name and let's also have the campaign ID. And that's it. Okay, so now let's run this. However, because it might be slightly difficult for us to essentially, you know, fake someone signing up to our form right now and getting a lead, what I am going to do is actually choose where to start this. So what I'm going to do is just right click on here, choose where to start, and I'm just going to do all. So all of all time, all my leads of all time of this campaign, this very short campaign, are going to be caught. So now let's run this and amazing. So that has now worked. And if we look in here, we indeed get the leads. So there we go. You can add a header, of course, so it's more obvious what these fields mean. So I would suggest doing that because, you know, otherwise this information can be quite confusing to someone who didn't set up the automation themselves as we just did, because of course we know what all of these columns are for. So again, I would suggest doing that, but you can do that by yourself. I hope you found this useful. I certainly did. And this is certainly something that I will be using for my own business. Okay, so let's go ahead and create this automation. I'm going to go ahead and create a new scenario. And first off, we're going to use a webhook. And this webhook is essentially going to listen out for interactions on a live website. That website is going to be one I have previously made using Wix.com. Okay, and it's a website for real estate. It is a real company and I'm going to be using the contact form in order to trigger something happening. So let's do it. Let's go over to the website that I have previously made. This is the website. Again, it's just one for managing Airbnb properties or for renting long term or short term or if you have a property you want to manage this should cover it and here is the contact form okay so we're pretending to be this company it is a live company that has launched on 3hogan.com and we essentially want to collect leads straight to a crm system so what's going to happen is a contact is going to leave a message for us so for example, Danny who works at Google would fill this out and this would trigger our webhook, which will then trigger Clearbit, another module we'll be using in order to essentially get information about the company that that client is emailing from. So for example, if the client used the email address with the domain google.com. Obviously, Google is a big company, so there's going to be a lot of online data on this. Clearbit will find out all the information about that company. So in other words, Google. And then we will also filter out the data and put that lead into HubSpot, so our CRM system, so that the three Hogan staff can essentially manage it from there. And we can even send off messages to a Slack channel if we wish. Okay? So let's do it. I'm going to pretend I am the developer working for 3hogan.com and I'm going to need Wix access. So let's go ahead and head over to Wix. Wix is just a website builder that I use to create this website. So if you want to use it, please go ahead. Just make sure to actually have your site live. So just like this one right here, that is important for this tutorial. Okay, so here is what it looks like behind the scenes. We can edit the website like so. And I'm just going to scroll all the way down to the bottom where the contact form lives. So here it is. You can simply add your own if you don't have one by going to contact forms and dragging one over. Okay, so for example, we can put in another one if we wish, just like this. OK, however, we're not going to do this. I'm just going to delete that because we already have one here. 
So making sure the Wix form is selected, I would simply go to form settings and we're going to head over to automations. So just click on that and view your automations. So this should take you to this dashboard. We can view any automations that exist. And now we're just going to scroll down and we're going to create an automation. So go ahead and click create automation. These are the popular ones. However, we are going to start from scratch. So just make sure to click start from scratch. And we're going to choose an app to trigger. So that is the Wix form as we saw here, Wix form. So let's go ahead and select the Wix form. Now I'm going to select the trigger on when the form is submitted, not for when a choice has been selected on a form. And we can choose which form to trigger this automation. So I'm going to be specific and say it's the contact form that I want to essentially trigger this automation. So if someone submits a form on the contact form, this should happen. And I don't want to limit the frequency. And once that is done, we're just going to send via webhook. So that's what we need. And next, we just need a target URL and we're going to send all the keys and values. OK, you can see the structure here of what we will send over or in other words, what we want to send over to our webhook. OK, so let's go ahead and do it. Let's create our webhook. So I'm just going to search for webhooks from the drop down. There we go. And we're going to create a custom webhook. So make sure to select custom webhook that triggers when webhook receives data. And now we're going to essentially create a hook. So let's go ahead and select that. You can choose to name this whatever you wish. I'm just going to leave it the generic title that it gave me. We're not going to put in any IP restrictions. OK, or essentially leave it empty if you don't want to check the IP address. And I'm just going to hit save. So great. So this is the target URL we need. I'm just going to copy all of that or you can copy the address to clipboard. And now let's go back to our automations and put in the target URL like so. OK, so essentially we're going to be sending that form data to this URL or in other words, sending it over to our webhook, which lives on make.com. And let's just activate this. Great. We can give this a name. I'm just going to call this leads and save it so that we know which webhook we just created. And there we go. There is our webhook. You can also view a summary. At the moment, there would have been zero triggers, but of course, we're going to trigger that now. So let's do it. So let's go back to our form. I'm just going to clear any caches in case there is some old data here. So clear browsing data clear data and let's go back and let's just go ahead with Bobby last name Brown email is Bobby at google.com so Bobby works at Google and he's using his work email essentially which is why it's got the at Google domain here and then we're just going to put hello Hogan holiday homes I am looking to rent a two bed for one month. OK, so that is the message that we're going to send. And I'm just going to hit submit. OK, it says thanks for submitting. So we have sent that over. Let's check if it worked. So if we go back here. And great, that has been successfully determined that is working. So let's click OK. If you also want to check, you can go back to your automations on Wix and you can view the summary and you should see that it has been triggered a total of one times. That's correct because we did send over a form submit just once. So this is looking good. Everything is aligned. So great. We can get rid of this now. Wonderful. So now that we have our webhook hooked up essentially to our form on 3hogan.com, 
I now need to send that form data. So in other words, Bobby, his first name, his last name, and his email address, so bobby at google.com, over to Clearbit. So we're gonna analyze essentially the domain name from which this was sent from. So I'm gonna add another module, and I'm gonna search for Clearbit. Okay, so Clearbit is here, and we're going to essentially get a company. So great, but of course we first need to establish a connection. So Clearbit essentially looks like this. It is a great B2B data platform that you can sign up to that essentially gives you information on companies like I just said, so you can get a lot about a company and the data you can get, I'm gonna show you. So first up, we just need to essentially sign up to this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and log in. You do need to sign in with HubSpot. So if you don't have a HubSpot account, please go ahead and sign up to one. So HubSpot is again, the CRM system that we will be using today. And once again, you can just sign up or get started for free. I already have a HubSpot account, so I'm just going to log in. I'm gonna sign in with Google and here we are, okay? This is essentially my account. I've just kind of put in my company details, such as, you know, the company name is 3Hogan, and I have my username and password and so on. And essentially what we wanna be doing is adding contacts to the contacts link here. At the moment, there is no contacts, okay? But that is something that we're going to add. So once you've signed up for HubSpot, you're going to go back to Clearbit and sign in with HubSpot. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click that. And this is connecting Clearbit to HubSpot. I'm gonna choose the account. Like I said, the account is 3Hogan because that is the one that I just created on HubSpot. I'm gonna choose the account. And I'm gonna click OK and great. So like I said, this is just linked to my HubSpot account. And now what I need to do is essentially connect Clearbit to here. So let's create a connection. I'm gonna just leave this as my Clearbit connection and it needs an API key. So I'm gonna show you how to find this. So the API key, well, it's actually taken from the Clearbit API documentation. So I'm just going to go to dashboard.clearbit.com forward slash docs in order to get essentially my API key. So let's do it. I'm just going to scroll down. Authentication is done via your account API key, which is, and this is unique to me. So I'm gonna copy this, okay? If you need to see your API keys, just go to the dashboard here. And here again is your secret API key. So if you need to change it or get a revoke, please do contact Clearbit, okay? Because you wanna keep that safe. So now let's go ahead and whack that in like so and save. So now in here, we just need to feed in whatever company we essentially want to get more information about. And in order to do that, well, we're going to use the data from the webhook, correct? And I'm gonna use the email address. So under the contact, I'm gonna get the email. Okay, so this should come back with essentially Bobby at google.com, correct? But we just want the google.com part. So I'm going to essentially write a function for this. I'm going to use get, open up my parenthesis. I'm going to do split, open up my parenthesis again, wrap this in parenthesis twice, but right before this one, I'm going to use a semicolon at, and then after the second one, I'm going to do semicolon two. Okay, so this is let you split out the domain name from the email address. So anything after the at sign will get put into here. Okay, wonderful. Great, and that's really it. So I'm just gonna click okay, and let's go ahead and essentially run this. So now once again, this is waiting for the data, right? So let's go here, and this time I'm gonna put Sandra, Sue, email sandra at google.com. Hello, I have a property I would like you to manage. 
and submit. Okay, so that data was finally sent over and the scenario was finalized and the scenario run was completed. So if you click on here, you will see the data that comes back from Clearbit. Okay, so once again, this data is simply Sandra's information. Okay, we have Sandra Wu. So under here, we have a lot of context. We just want essentially the contact. So the name, Sandra Sue. The email is sandra at google.com, correct? And a bunch of information. We even get over the message if we need it. And here, of course, we've split out Google dot com from the email address correct and this is the output so essentially we have the legal name of google which is google llc we also have the domain name and we also have the aliases so all the aliases that google owns this is pretty cool information all the sites and phone numbers and emails attached to it which at the moment for google.com is none a description of the company, the year it was founded, the location, the time zone even, which we will be using, its logo, Facebook handle. I mean, this information is just incredible. So let's go ahead and use it, right? And we are going to use it in order to create roots. So once again, I'm just going to shut down Clearbit. I'm going to shut down Clearbit here and shut down HubSpot. We're going to keep 3hogan.com and let's continue. So let's add another module and I'm just going to add a router. So under flow control, we can select router like so and it will split off in order to create two routes. However, we're going to add another one. So let's just go ahead and click on it again and three routes will now appear. So essentially what these routes are going to help me do are filter out the data that comes back from Clearbit about the company. And we are going to do that by writing specific conditions that must be met in order for the data to pass through. So if I go ahead and click on here, we can set up a filter in order to do that. So I'm going to call this filter continent equals America. Let's say the employee count of the company has to be larger than 100 and category we are going to put as software. OK, just as a reminder of what this route is all about, because that is essentially the filter we're going to set up. So in other words, we want the company to be based in America, to have an employee count of over 100 and for the company category to be software, for example. OK, so perhaps as a property company, we want to target people in America that work for a company that has over 100 employees. So they have a lot of income and maybe even work in software as that is a high income field. This is just an example, of course. So let's go ahead and write a condition. So for that, I can, for example, choose a time zone and I can choose contains and make it case insensitive. And if I put America, this means that if the company that comes back from Clearbit contains the continent of America as the time zone. So as you can see here from the one we just received, Google under a time zone it does contain america it also has los angeles in there but because we're using the operator of contains it's just going to pick out america and allow it through this filter great so that is one condition but let's create the others so i'm going to use the and and rule and here let's work on the employees so what I'm going to do this time is select employees because I know that's something that comes back from Clearbit, which is a great stat to have. So let's just go ahead and find that metric here. So under metrics, we can find the employees. So I'm just going to select that. You can use maybe market cap. You can use annual revenue instead. It really is up to you. And I'm going to use a text operator of greater than. OK, and I'm just going to stick 100. So that's our second condition. Of course, Google meets both of these. It's in America and it's definitely got over 100 employees. So let's create the third. 
Now the third criteria that I wanted to pass or in other words the final condition is the industry. So let's go ahead and select category industry and we're going to have it contain case insensitive software, right? So let's go ahead and find contains case insensitive software. So this just means that even though software is spelled with a capital S here and a small s here, it doesn't matter. It will still get filtered through. So great. Those are my three conditions. So wonderful. Let's see if this works. Let's see if the filter catches it. So once again, I'm just going to run this. And of course, we need to submit a form. So this time, let's put Xavier Zhu, Xavier at google.com. Hey, do you have any short term rentals in Dubai? And hit submit. Okay, so amazing that should get picked up and it does. So if you zoom in here, continent equals America, employees over 100, category equals software. That's just the label we gave this router. And let's now send it somewhere. And we're going to send it to HubSpot. So let's go ahead and search for HubSpot. I'm going to search for HubSpot CRM. And we are just going to essentially create a contact. So let's search for create a contact. I'm going to select that. Wonderful. And let's create a connection. So I'm just going to select this right here. I'm going to choose to leave this as my HubSpot CRM connection and hit save. And now it's just going to take me to log into HubSpot. So contacting HubSpot from make. So it's trying to make a connection. We're going to choose the account. So it is three Hogan. That is the account that we made for our HubSpot account. I'm going to choose the account. And I'm just going to allow Make to manage and view our CRM data. And we're just going to tick on here to accept those terms and conditions. And we're going to connect the app. OK, wonderful. So that's waiting for authorization. And that's now done. We're going to now leave the view method as come back and we're going to add the properties because we're essentially going to get that information that comes back from Clearbit and also comes back from the webhook in order to put it in the CRM system. So let's go ahead and add this. And I'm just going to put the key as, let's go with first name. And the value of this, we're going to not get back from Clearbit, but let's get it from the webhook. So from the form submission. So let's go under contact. Let's go under name. And I'm just going to select the first name. Great. Let's add another one. So this time also, I'm just going to select the last name. So let's go with this. And once again, I'm just going to, from the webhook, get the contact name, last name. And there we go. Let's add another one. So we've got the first name, we've got the last name being saved on the hotspot. We have also all of these other properties to our disposal. So it really is up to us, whatever we want to choose. Let's go ahead and put the company name. OK, so this time I'm going to get this from Clearbit. Let's get the legal name or you can just choose the name that is up to you. Let's also perhaps get this person's email address because we probably want to keep that right. So let's find email address. And this time, once again, I'm just going to go back to webhooks and get the email address. OK, wonderful. So this is looking good. Let's add a few more. Let's also perhaps have the annual revenue. I think that's a good one. And I did see that on clear bit. So let's go here and this comes under metrics. So let's find metrics annual revenue. OK. And we can keep going and going, but another good one to have is, I'm just going to show you this now, the score of the company, or as HubSpot likes to call it, the clout score. Okay. And the value of this, because it is, you know, a company with over 100 employees in the software world, I'm going to manually hard code the clout score of this so that in HubSpot it shows up as hot. And as the clout score, I'm just going to put 10. 
Okay, and I'm just gonna hit okay. So let's go ahead and try this out, right? So once again, we're just gonna use Google uh, as the example because we want to essentially see if it filters out so let's try it out. I'm just going to run that and now it's waiting for the data. And let's go ahead and go with Gary. G, Gary at google.com. Do you have any studios to rent in Dubai for short term? Submit. Okay, and the scenario was completed. That is good and amazing. So this has worked. It seems to have got to the correct spot and it is from Gary. Okay, we've got the email domain. So now if we go to HubSpot, I'm just going to log in. I'm going to sign in with Google. And once again, if we now look in contacts, we should see Gary there. So contacts. And there he is, Gary G. We even get a little icon of Google, that's where he works. We get his email address, okay, and as well as when this was created, we get two sample contacts from HubSpot 2. And if I click on Gary, it's basically got all the information that I sent over that is necessary for my company, okay? And to be fair, we just sent over the first name, the second name, the email address and the cloud score. So this is looking wonderful. I'm just going to do one more thing. So now that we're getting Gary in there, I'm just going to shut that down. We also want to notify everyone at 3hogan.com, so everyone in our company, that we've got a new lead. And because we use Slack there, I'm going to send that over to Slack. So I'm just going to add another module. I'm just going to zoom in so you can see and click here and now let's search for slack so here we go and we are going to create a message so let's go ahead and find create a message and there we go and now let's create a connection so this connection type is going to be for a slack user let's name it my slack user connection or you can name it whatever you wish and i'm just going to hit save and this will essentially prompt me to log in to my Slack channel. Okay, as I already have one, it's a Slack channel called 3Hogan. You can add another workspace if you wish, but I'm going to keep it on that. And I'm just going to allow this. So I'm allowing it essentially to send messages to 3Hogan, which is a Slack channel that I have made. So we need to enter the channel name here. I'm going to enter it manually. So I'm just going to head over to Slack. And here is my Slack username, so 3hogan.slack.com. And now it's asking me for a channel ID or name. So if we go back to Slack, I can create a channel. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to create a channel. I'm going to call it Q1 Leads. So that is the name of my channel. I'm just going to hit next. I'm going to make it visible to anyone in 3hogan. So let's go ahead and click create and I'm going to automatically add anyone who joins 3Hogan. So there we go. Okay, Q1 Leads is now here. Great. So now I can put Q1 Leads and as the text, I'm going to put, you have a new lead, lead email, address. You can even put on hub spot so people know where to go. And then here we can put the lead address. Essentially, we can take it from HubSpot. So right here, we can even have the clout score. So that people know this is a good lead that they need to follow. Okay, so here's a clout score. I'm just going to put that here. And I'm just going to put clout score and really that's it so let's go ahead and click ok so now let's try this one more time so i'm going to run this and we can wait for new data so now it's waiting and i'm just going to go with fred fee fred at google.com and 
Hey, any two beds for me? And I'm just going to submit. So now if we look in here, it's accepting the data, waiting for the data, and as soon as it gets it, hopefully we should get a Slack message. So boom, and now if we look in Slack, amazing. We have a new lead on HubSpot, lead email address, and the cloud score of 10, as of course we hard coded 10 as a cloud score for Google. So amazing, this is incredible. I'm so, so happy with this. We do have a few more things to do, and that is fill out the other routes, but it's just gonna take the same steps that we took previously, so this is a bit of great repetition for us. So let's do it. So let's write our second route. So I'm going to set up a filter for this. This time, let's do continent America employees, maybe smaller than 100 category software. Okay, so we know what to do. The condition for this, we're going to use time zone and we're going to do contains, case okay, insensitive America. And another condition, this time for the employee count. So let's go ahead and find the metrics once more and find the employees. And let's say they have to be lower than, so let's find less than 100. Okay, and add one more rule. Let's have the industry so industry here again contains case insensitive we're going to go with software and great so that is our second scenario we can even move this out a little bit if you want to read and now let's do our third one so this is essentially just going to take anything that doesn't fit the ones above so let's just call this all else okay so now I'm just going to once again add HubSpot CRM and we're going to create a contact. So this one right here, compact, we're going to keep that the same. Once again, let's have first name. So I'm just going to search first name and we'll get this from the email contact. So I'm just going to get name and select the first name. And let's add another property. The key for this is going to be last name. And we'll have the last name from the custom webhook. We're also going to get the company annual revenue. We're also going to get the company name. So let's go ahead with that. And this comes from Clearbit. And let's get the legal name. We'll also get the email address. So let's go ahead and get the email address from the webhook once more. So let's find email. And I think we said we would add the annual revenue as well. And again, this is from Clearbit. So I'm just gonna get the annual revenue, which is a metric that should live down here. So annual revenue. And we've got our custom one, which is the clout score as well. So let's go ahead and search for clout score. And this one, let's maybe give it like a seven. Okay, great. And finally, I'm just gonna add the last one too. So HubSpot CRM, create a contact. It's just going to be the same. So this is for essentially catching everything that the filters don't catch because the clout score, we're going to give it a slightly different, right? So first name, let's get for contacts name first. Let's also have last name, last name. Let's also have the company name. And as the value, we'll get this from Clearbit, the legal name. Let's also add the email address. So I'm just going to find the email. And this will come from the webhook. So let's get the email. Let's also get the annual revenue, which lives in Clearbit. 
So again, this is in metrics annual revenue and our custom one which is the clout score so let's search for clout score and i'm going to give this a two value and click ok and now for the slack integration so for this perhaps let's copy what the text we have is here okay and let's add a module so i'm going to select slack we're going to create a message to the channel with ID Q1 leads and the text we're just going to paste. So we're going to paste that text and as the lead email address, this is going to come from HubSpot. We're going to find that email and we're going to also find the cloud score, which was somewhere at the bottom here, cloud score general. Making sure to spell Q1 leads just the same as here. Great. And let's hit OK and create a message. Uh, once again, this should go to Q1 leads. As the text, we're once again, we're gonna have, you have a new lead on HubSpot. The email address is gonna be the email, and then let's also put the clout score here. So I'm just gonna scroll down to find that clout score once more. There are many ways you can, of course, do this. Perhaps you want to set up a different channel per each lead, whether it's one with Cloud Score 10 or one with Cloud Score 8 or one with Cloud Score 2. It is completely your choice. Wonderful. I'm just going to save this for now. So let's go ahead and test it out. So I'm just once again going to run this and wait for new data. And of course, we need to fill this out. So I'm going to go with Ania. Kubo, I'm going to put Ania at freecodecamp.org and I'm going to put hello and submit. And now let's wait for that to do its thing. Now, FreeCodeCamp does have less than 100 employees and it is in America and it is in software. So I would expect it to go down this channel, but we will see if it doesn't, it should end up here with a cloud score of two. So let's see which route it ends up in. Ah, so it seemed to have gone this way. I wonder why that is. Let's have a look. So freecodecamp.org. It's got the description. Time zone is America. Interesting. And employees is 46. So perhaps it's the industry that is making it go down this route. Let's have a look. Category industry diversify consumer services. Okay, but if it was software, hopefully it would have gone this route instead. And let's just check if that has worked in Slack. Let's see the message. So we should get a message. Uh, we have a new lead on HubSpot, lead email address, and AfricoGam.org, cloud score two. So we did expect that. That is looking good. And if we look on HubSpot now, we have Anya Kubo. We've got the logo. We've got Anya at FreeCodeGap.org. This is looking so wonderful. I'm so, so happy with this. Okay, great. So I hope you've learned a lot. Of course, there is a lot of personalized stuff you can do. You don't have to follow along with my strict instructions, especially when it comes to the routing part. Of course, each company is unique, so please go ahead and set up your own filters around this. Hopefully, you should have the knowledge to do so now. Okay, so in this scenario, we're going to pretend we're a real estate company and we are essentially looking to find leads of owners of properties. They either want to sell them or rent them out. Okay, so we're going to have a forum somewhere on the internet that collects their name, their contact email address and the rough value of their property in order to then put all that information into a CRM, HubSpot CRM to be precise. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. I'm just going to show you exactly where in HubSpot we're going to put this. So here is HubSpot. I'm just going to go ahead and log in because I already have a HubSpot account. So I'm going to choose to sign in with Google. Of course, please do sign up to HubSpot if you don't have an account already. I'm just signing in like so, and it's going to take me to my HubSpot account. Now in HubSpot, you can collect contacts or you can collect deals. So we're going to do that under sales and deals. We're going to start deals in order to take them from prospecting to finalized and closed. 
So we're going to essentially be adding to the columns of deal owner. We have create date, last activity date, close date, and a bunch more. So this is what we're going to be using. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm going to create a new scenario. And like I said, we're going to be using a form. I'm going to go ahead and use type form for this. Here it is. And we're going to watch responses, but we're going to choose this one. So instant. Okay. So it triggers as soon as someone fills in your form somewhere out there in the world. So that's what we're going to choose. And I'm going to go ahead and create a web hook. So please go ahead and choose create web hook. And because I have used type form before, it already shows up here. So for those of you who don't have a type form account, please go ahead and sign up. I do. So I'm just going to go ahead and log in. So I'm going to choose to log in with Google. Please go ahead and do all the steps that you need in order to sign up or log in if you've used type form before. And it should take you here. Okay, so first off, of course, we need to create a new form. You can do this using AI. So this is quite fun. You can essentially tell it what you want to create and then we'll suggest inputs and essentially suggest a form that you might need. You might not even think of some of the inputs. So sometimes it's fun to use this. So for example, lead generation form like that. But I know what I want to create. So I'm just going to go ahead and choose create new form and start from scratch. Okay, so that's what I'm going to choose. I'm going to call this lead generation. You can call it whatever you wish. And I'm going to say that this is a lead gen form. So I'm going to click continue. Now, this is great because you can really go wild on designing this. Um, we have, hello, what's your name? So I do suggest keeping that because that is something we're going to need. We're going to have the deal name in here. So let's go ahead and keep that hello, what is your name? And then someone will answer it. I'm going to make this required and I'm actually going to go ahead and change the image because we're a real estate company. So you can go in the media gallery and select from all the things that Typeform has. So if I type in real estate, just like so, I'm going to go ahead and select this one right here. And wonderful. So that's just looking better. To go to the next question, you can simply click here. The second question it has given me is nice to meet you. And you can actually insert the name that they just answered before. I'll show you how to do that. How's your day going? However, we don't really need this. I'm going to go ahead and delete it. So please go ahead and do the same. To add a new question, though, just go ahead and click here. And this is lead qualification. I think the next thing we should ask for is perhaps their email. So I'm going to go ahead and add that here. Uh, we can go nice to meet you. And then the at sign will allow us to bring us previous inputs. So I can go ahead and do that. Nice to meet you. And then whatever their name is, please provide an email where we can contact you. And then we have that. Let's also make this required. So wonderful. This is looking good. I'm just going to add one more question. And this is going to be a drop down. So this is just to get the value of the property. OK, so we know how much this deal is worth, I guess. Again, these questions are just for demo purposes. If you have a company, I would strongly suggest really sitting down and really thinking about what questions you want to ask someone. But again, demo purposes, I'm not uh, using my emotional intelligence or anything like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and write how much is your property worth? Very direct. Okay, and here we could just write it. I'm just going to go ahead and select uh, a few. Again, please feel free to do this much better than I am. Uh, let's go ahead and also specify that this is in US dollars. So there's five options right here. So that's the three questions I'm going to have. Let's also make this required. Of course, if the property is worth more, it would be worth having more options. And let's have an ending. So I'm going to select here for an ending and I'm going to choose to have an end screen. You can redirect to a URL. However, this is a paid 
feature. So if you don't want to pay for it, don't use that. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm going to go ahead and say thank you name. We will be in contact soon. And then you can, of course, choose to have these share icons. I'm going to get rid of that. So great. Now I'm just going to delete this ending as we just want the one ending page. And I'm going to go ahead and publish this. So that is now being published. Let's go ahead and copy that link to check it out. So here is my forum. This is what I would use in order to essentially share it around. Let's go ahead and do Ania Kubo. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with Ania at code with Ania dot com. Okay. And then I'm just going to select the first one and submit. And great, that is now finished. And you can see my name is showing up. This is looking cool. So now let's go ahead and actually use this. So I'm going to go ahead and select the form ID. So this should show up. I'm going to refresh this. There we go, lead generation, because this is what I called my forum. If we go back to my workspaces, you will see that's the only form in here. It's called lead generation. So there's only one in the drop down right here. And I'm just going to click save. So that's really it. And I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. Now we need to connect this to HubSpot. So I'm going to search for HubSpot just like so. And this time we're going to create a deal. So search for create a deal and just select it from all the various things that exist. Now we're going to make a HubSpot connection. Uh, of course, I've already connected this to my make.com platform, hence it's showing up. So please go ahead and do that if yours isn't showing up and you need to set up that connection. Now I'm going to go ahead and map things out. So the key here, again, this is just from the column names that we see up here. I'm going to go ahead and have the, should we have the deal name? For the deal name, I'm just going to use whoever filled out the form's first name. So here, because we already connected type form, it's already connecting to our forum. So the first question we asked was, hello, what's your name? Then we have nice to meet you, your name, please provide an email. And how much is your property worth in dollars? So let's go ahead with the first name, right? Because that's what we want to the value to be under deal name. I'm going to go ahead and add another one. So let's also have a deal stage this time. So I can actually just search for a deal stage and we're just going to hard code this okay, to be prospecting. So this is hard coded because, you know, if something comes in, it's always going to be fresh. It's going to start prospecting and then develop to the further stages of the sales pipeline. Next one I'm also going to have is the amount. So the amount here is just going to be how much the deal is worth. And I guess we can have the property worth for that. OK, which has to be a number. Otherwise, this will not work. Hence, I wrote numbers when writing out my type form form. OK, wonderful. So I'm happy with this. I'm just going to select OK. So now let's go ahead and do it. Right. I'm going to run this and this is now going to wait for information. So I'm going to have to go back here and then let's get the URL for this. So copy link and I'm just going to paste it in here once more. And this time, let's do someone else. Let's do Bobby Brown. OK. And then let's do Bobby B at gmail.com. OK. Uh, let's go ahead and put this one this time and submit. OK. So this means that this should now run. Uh, something did not work. Prospecting is not a valid pipeline stage ID. So that is fine. Here are the valid options. Let's go ahead and do this here. We can do qualified to buy. So we can actually select that. This just means that here under value, I'm just going to change that to be qualified to buy and hit OK. So once again, so that debugging tool is really super useful. Let's try this once more. I'm just going to refresh the form and then let's go with Ken Fang. 
Okay. Ken F at gmail.com. Okay. And then let's just select another value and hit submit. So now that should work. That has because all of these bubbles have gone through. We don't get any errors. We don't have to debug anything, even though the debugging method is quite cool. That does give you a lot of information there in order to make debugging a heck of a lot easier. So now under deals, ta-da, we have Ken Fang. We have the deals stage as qualified to buy because we did hard code that everyone in here is qualified to buy, essentially. We have a deal owner, which is unassigned, and we have the deal value amount. Great. This is looking good. And of course, if we add more leads to this via the form, they will also show up. So great. I hope this was useful. Thank you very much. Okay, in this section, I'm going to show you how to essentially filter out if leads are qualified enough. So for example, you get a lead from the company apple.com. So someone's emailed in with the apple.com domain. You can use automation to essentially filter out if this is a company you want to pursue. So for example, if it's got a high enough employee count, high enough market cap and so on. So I'm going to show you how to do this using Google Sheets and Clearbit. So let's do it. Let's go ahead and create a new scenario for this. And we are going to be using a spreadsheet. So a spreadsheet of these leads, it's going to have an email address, it's going to have their name, and then we're going to automate the others. So just head on over to your Google Drive and create a sheet. I'm just going to select sheets in order to do this and go ahead and select blank sheet. And let's go ahead and call this leads to qualify so that we can pick it out later on. I'm going to keep this as sheet one, but of course, please feel free to rename this if you wish. This you can rename, this you can rename. Just make sure to keep an eye on this so that you don't lose track while following this tutorial. So let's go ahead and first off create the table head. I'm going to have email, like I said, we'll also have the name of the lead. We'll have the lead status. We're all going to start off with the same lead status for all of these at the beginning. We'll also have a last scene. Why not the company name? And let's also have the number of employees. We can have the employee range as well. Let's also have the market cap for the company and the Alexa ranking. This is going to be a global ranking of the company. So for example, let's go ahead and do this. Our first lead that we have is Michael Scott at Dunder Mifflin paper.com. And then of course, let's have the name. So this is Michael Scott. The lead status, uh, we're going to have not verified and we're going to override this. This is going to be overwritten once we essentially communicate with Clearbit and use the automation to essentially fill out this and these as well. The last scene is going to be a generic date. OK, this is just for demo purposes. So cool that we have our first lead. Now you can also choose to, you know, let's go ahead and make this look a little bit prettier just so you can visually see that this is indeed the header. This is essentially where all our leads is going to go. I'm just going to make it yellow. And we can also use this right here to underline it if we wish. So great. Um, I'm going to fill out a few more of these while we are here. So let's have John Doe at integromat.com as a company that uh, will definitely qualify, I believe. And let's put John Doe. Again, let's put not verified. And as the date here, I'm just going to put that. Let's also have Dwight Schrute at Dunder. Let's make sure to spell it the same. I'm just going to copy that dundermifflinpaper.com. This does exist on clearbit.com. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's just for demo purposes, but still, it's kind of fun. Dwight Schrute, not verified. And let's put a date for this too. 
The next one is maybe have the company Apple. So Jane Doe at apple.com. We, of course, know this is a very big company, but let's see if Clearbit does. So once again, not verified. I'm just going to put a date. And then we're going to see if it'll pick up Apple, the company name, the number of employees it has, and the employee range, as well as the market cap and the Alexa ranking of Apple, as in the thing that makes your iPhones and so on. Let's also have another company, Eddie Jones at chevron.com. So Eddie Jones, not verified. And let's put a date here as well. Uh, and one last one, Jim Halpert at Dunder Mifflin. Jim Halpert. Not verified, 2203, 2020. Okay, great. So that is my spreadsheet. Please make sure to make the same as this for now for demo purposes. And once you understand this scenario, you can then go on and make your own. So copy this, pause here if you need to. And once you are ready, let's go. So I'm just going to go back here. And the first thing we need to do is, of course, listen out to Google Sheets. So go ahead and find Google Sheets on here. Just like I have. And we're going to watch for new rows. So we're going to watch new rows, this first one right here. And whenever a new row is added, at the moment we've added a lot of rows, then this will trigger some stuff. So let's create a connection first. So I'm just going to select this. It's going to be a Google connection. That's what I've chosen to call this connection. Uh, and this is just allowing Integromat to essentially give us access. OK, so we're going to have to sign in with Google. This is going to take me to this pop up right here. I'm going to choose the account I want to sign into. And then I'm going to just click Continue. So great, Make wants to access your Google account. I'm going to click Allow, and then that should be it. So now we are connected to my Google account. Uh, we can test this out because I can select the spreadsheet ID and search for leads to qualify. So this first one right here. And it's found it. And it also knows that we just have sheet one. We have one sheet. That's what we called it here. So we're just picking this out out of leads to qualify. Great. This table does contain a header, as you can see here. So I'm going to keep that as yes. Uh, the rows with headers are A to Z. I'm going to keep that the same. And I'm just going to hit OK. Wonderful. And I'm just going to select all. OK. So now let's go ahead and add another module. So we did say we want to use Clearbit in order to assess the person or company that essentially we're going to feed in. So select get a person or company. And once again, we're going to have to create a connection for this. So let's go ahead and create a connection. Now this is going to need an API key. So please go ahead and head over to Clearbit. So here we are. I have logged into this previously, so here I am. Of course, please sign up if you need to. I already have an account, which I've already done all the sign up process for already. So I'm just going to choose to log in. Uh, I'm going to put in my email address here. I'm just going to put Anya at code with Anya.com and send in a sign in link. So now if I head over to Gmail this time, I'm just going to head over to my Gmail account, of course. I should see that in my email. And I do. So I'm just going to choose to log in. OK, so this is just what you have to do in order to log into Clearbit. And it's going to ask you to sign in with HubSpot. OK, so you need to also have a HubSpot account in order to do this. If you don't, you'll be prompted once again to sign up to HubSpot. But I already do have a HubSpot account, so I'm just going to choose to sign in. Great. OK, so let's go ahead and sign in. I'm just going to choose to sign in with Google. So once again, I am just going through the steps in order to sign up. And then my company that I have on HubSpot would show up. So here is my account. It's called 3Hogan. It's from the very first video that we did in this course. So let's go ahead and choose that account. 
Great. So this app is now requesting access to my HubSpot account as well because Clearbit is linked to HubSpot. And once you have accepted that, it will take you to this dashboard. So here is your dashboard, but in order to actually get the API, you're going to have to go to a different URL. It's dashboard.clearbit.com forward slash API. So make sure to type that out and hit enter. And here is your API key. Okay, just go ahead and copy that. Once again, please keep this safe. And if you do lose it, you can get it changed or revoked by contacting Clearbit. So great, let's now go back to here and just paste in that API key and I'm going to hit save. So wonderful, that is now doing its thing. And all we're going to do is get the email address from the Google Sheet. So just select email right here. Okay, once again, this has been read from this Google Sheet. So it's taking the columns right here. As you will see, make sure just to select it and don't have any other text in here. And that's it. Just go ahead and hit OK. Now we're going to actually do some routing. So just find the router under flow control and we're essentially going to write some routes. So we're going to have to define what makes this a qualified lead. OK, so we can do that here. We can set up a filter. And let's just say that, you know, this is a qualified lead if let's write a condition if the company so i'm just going to go ahead and this is essentially what's coming back to us from clearbit we have an example as well that's quite nice for them to provide an example value for us so we can kind of see what's going on so there's a lot coming back from clearbit there's you know, stuff under Facebook, stuff under GitHub even, so GitHub accounts, geography, this is really crazy. The one we need to find, however, is metrics. And let's just say that use the employees for this. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's say that if the employees, which in this case is 90, is larger than or equal so let's find that from here greater than or you can do greater than or equal to it is up to you and let's go with 50 then it makes it a qualified lead okay that for us is a qualified lead of course you can change it you can put 500 in which case you're only targeting you know bigger companies than ones with 50 employees so that is my definition of a qualified read and then here is just going to be all the not qualified ones which is essentially just going to take everything else so we can just label this not qualified lead okay and i'm just going to leave it blank one other thing we're going to have to do here is just set this as a fallback and just hit okay so now here we're going to have to send that qualified lead to google sheets and we're just going to update a row so once again, all I'm going to do is essentially pick the spreadsheet ID. So leads to qualify. Okay, that is my spreadsheet ID. And then let's find the sheet name, which is sheet one. The row number is just going to be whatever row we're working on. So it's not going to come from Clearbit. So I'm going to collapse that. It's going to come from Google Sheet. And I'm just going to select the row number. This table does contain headers. We do know that. The email address, well, that's already been done, as is the name. So we'll keep that as it is. The lead status we want to override. And we're going to put quality. Okay, so we can put qualified there. Last scene, we're going to leave blank. Once again, this is just me hard coding something. And this is what's going to come back from Clearbit that we want to fill in. So the company, well, we're just going to put the company name and that lives here. So under company name, let's also fill in the number of employees. So once again, this is a whole object right uh, we're going to go into company we're going to go into metrics and we're going to get the employee count then we'll have the employee range which also lives under metrics we're going to get the market cap okay so if that exists then it will be put in there and the alexa ranking the global ranking of the company and hit okay 
And now we also need to do the same for here. So let's update a row. This is for the not qualified leads. The only difference here, I'm just going to show you. So first off, let's actually select the spreadsheet that we need. So leads to qualify. And then just make sure that the sheet number is also selected and it's correct. So the sheet name is going to be sheet one. The row number that we're working with, once again, this comes from Google Sheets. So we're just going to select the row number. The table does contain headers. The email is going to be the same. The name is going to be the same. Like I said, this is going to be identical to what's going on here, apart from the lead status, which is going to be not qualified and we're going to essentially overwrite the not verified here. Okay. Uh, last scene we're going to leave as it is the company. Well, once again, this comes from clear bit. So let's go in here. Uh, we don't need the person. We're going to have the company name for this. So company name. Let's also get the employees, which is under metrics. So the employee count, the employee range, which is this, the market cap, so once again, this is under metrics and the Alexa ranking, which is right here. Great. So I'm happy with that. Let's hit OK. And now let's give it a whirl. So I'm just going to go ahead and run this and see it completing all the steps and wonderful that is done and if we look in here so this is working let's once again run it once more so there we go it's doing its thing and great and let's run it once more and great so we have now filled out this whole sheet this is looking good i'm really happy with this if you want to change it so that, you know, you can essentially limit the maximum number of results or you want all of them to run, that is up to you. I'm going to go ahead and change this to one. And now if we add something else, so let's go ahead and add maybe these two again, not verified, not verified make this be danny do danny do and here annie lee annie lee and run this again then this time you will see just one time it has run Great, and that line has been added. This is looking wonderful. And that's it. Now you can go ahead and add way more leads to this if you want. That part is going to be completely up to you. Okay, so now that you know how to do this, I would suggest making this by yourself from scratch. Perhaps changing the uh, definitions for a qualified lead and a not qualified lead, that could be a fun one to do. In addition to, you know, having just one criteria in order to make this a qualified lead, you can have more. If you want to add more, you can do the and, and rule in which this has to be true and this has to be true, okay? Or you can do it that this has to be true or something has to be true. So I could say that, you know, either the company metrics employee count has to be greater than 50, or, you know, if we don't care about that, we can do something else. We can use the metrics annual revenue, perhaps. And if it's higher than a certain amount, so we can do greater than, you know, 10,000, then it's also a qualified lead. So that is something you can also do and just have a play around with. It is going to be completely up to you. You can also use metrics and things that come back from the object from Clearbit that you don't necessarily use here. So you don't, as you notice, we didn't choose to use the Alexa ranking, the market hub, the employee range. Uh, or the company, we chose something completely all together. So please feel free to have a look through all of these and 
you know, you can use whichever one you want. You can use the founding year, for example, too. So there really is so, so much you can play around with. Okay, I'm just going to delete that so we can keep it the same for now. You can also choose whether to schedule this. So you can schedule it at 15 minute intervals or once a day or on certain days of the month. That is also a fun one. And like I said, if you click on here, here is where you limit the amount of number of results to be worked with during one cycle. So that is something to keep in mind. That's why we you know, got two to update each time. And when we changed it, it was just one. You can also change it if you wish. Great. I hope that was useful for you. Did you know that you could use a spreadsheet that has all the information about a product to generate an SEO friendly description? For example, say I ran a real estate company and had hundreds of properties in my portfolio. I have the property address, how many bedrooms it has and the view from each one. Now, based on just these three properties, I can generate some pretty compelling descriptions to help sell my properties in under a minute including how far away the property is from a metro station, what are the closest landmarks to it, and more. I can do so using ChatGPT and its access to global map features. I'm going to show you how to do this next. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a scenario. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that here. We're going to create a scenario that allows us to create those completions that we were talking about mainly completions to go here to fill out a description of my property based on the property name, the bedrooms, the bathrooms, the city view and the address. And we're going to use the address in order to find the closest landmarks and the closest metro to our property using OpenAI. So this is pretty cool. Obviously, there is not a lot of data here as this is just for demo purposes, but I hope you can imagine how useful this is when you have thousands of properties in your database. Okay, so let's do it. I'm going to go ahead and create that scenario now and we're going to add, you guessed it, our module. So I'm just going to select here and the module we're going to start off with is Google Sheets as we're going to have to pick up the data from the Google Sheet first. So I'm going to select watch new rows. So this will trigger when a new row is added. So let's go ahead and select that and I'm going to create a connection. So let's go ahead and create my connection, my Google connection. And I'm just going to sign in with Google in order to allow make.com to speak to my Google account. So I'm just going to have to sign in in order to do that. And make wants to access my Google account. This is my Google account. I essentially agree to allow it to have access to see, edit, create and delete my Google Drive files as well as see, edit, create and delete all my Google Sheets spreadsheets. So I'm just going to click allow in order to do that. Great and amazing that is now done. I'm going to choose to search by path. We can choose to enter manually or select from all and then I'm just going to select my drive as in my Google Drive and then we're going to have to find the spreadsheet ID. We're going to do so by name. So this is my properties. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to search for my properties. Just like so. Great. And now we're going to have to pick out the sheet name. So there could be multiple tabs here or multiple sheet names. However, there is just one which makes our life a lot easier because from the drop down, we could just select properties. Now, this table does contain headers, as you can see here. So I'm going to keep yes in the drop down. OK, and then row with headers. Now I can just keep it as it is or I can be super specific saying it's A1. B1, C1, D1, E1 and F1. So I've just changed that. You don't have to if you don't want to. I'm just going to make the maximum number of results to be worked with during one execution cycle one and I'm going to hit OK. Now when it says choose where to start, I'm just going to select all and once again hit OK as well. Great. Now that we have that, we're going to have to 
add another module. So this time I'm going to choose the OpenAI module as we want to essentially talk to OpenAI in order to send a prompt over. So that's what I'm going to do and we're going to choose to generate a completion. So let's select create a completion and I'm just going to move that over here so it is connected to the first module we made and I'm going to create a connection. So I'm just going to have to head over to OpenAI and log in. So this is my OpenAI account. I have signed up and I am paying customer. So just make sure that your account is funded and you are a paying customer. Or if you have some free credits to use, that's great for you. But just make sure you do have some funds in this. Otherwise, it will not work. Great. Now I'm just going to head over to API keys and I'm going to create a new secret key. I'm going to call this demo key just like so and create it. Of course, you know the drill. Please do keep this API key safe because if someone takes it and uses it for their own project, they could rack up loads and loads on your credit card bill. So don't share it around. And in fact, I am going to delete this after the tutorial is finished. So please don't take mine either. Wonderful. So we have our API key and now we're just going to paste it in like so. The other thing we need to do is also paste in the organization ID and that can be found back here under settings and there we are. That is my one right here. And just paste it in like so and hit save. So that connection is now done. We can now communicate with OpenAI. So now I'm going to select create a chat completion. This is just so that we can use the latest model. OK, we're not really creating a chat. We're just going to send over one prompt. But if we were to choose create a prompt completion, the latest model we can get only goes up to GPT 3.5. OK, so there we go. Now, if you don't have access to GPT-4, I am going to show you how to use GPT-3.5 because there will be one thing that we have to do differently, but I will show you that in a bit. For now, I'm going to show you how to use chat GPT-4. And like I said, for that, we're going to have to create a chat completion. And this will give us GPT-4. Again, we are not making a chat. We're simply going to send over one prompt and get a returning response. So just keep that in mind. Now, as the message, well, we're going to have to choose a role. I'm going to choose the user. So me, because me as a user, I'm going to be asking OpenAI a question. And that question is essentially a request. And my request is, please write a description no longer than seven sentences on my property, along with the nearest landmarks based on its address. Please also mention how many minutes walk from the metro, only if it's less than 15 minutes. Great. And now we're just going to feed in that information. Please write this based on the following property information. And I'm going to put the property name. Uh, and we're going to actually use the data coming back from our Google Sheet. Okay, this is the data coming back from our Google Sheet, thanks to the first module we made. And I'm just going to select the property name. I'm also going to put the amount of bedrooms and use the bedrooms column and the amount of bathrooms and use the bathrooms column. We're also going to get the view, which is either a city view or a sea view. So let's put in the view and of course the address and that lives in the address column. Great. So that's essentially what I am sending over to OpenAI in order for it to make a description for us. So I'm just going to hit OK. Now that we are essentially sending a prompt over to OpenAI and it's going to get us a result, we want to put it back in the spreadsheet or more specifically in this column. So once again, let's get a module. So I'm just going to go ahead and add a module. It's going to be Google Sheets and we are going to update a row this time. Now we are going to once again use this spreadsheet ID. We can use it from this Google Sheet right here from that data. 
but then we'll just have to enter it manually okay so there we go and I'm just gonna select the spreadsheet ID okay which essentially is my properties we'll get the sheet name but that's being fed in from the first Google sheet and then we're gonna get the row number so I'm just gonna whack that in like so now the column range I'm just gonna select A to Z and then we're going to actually find column F so this one right here so right there and we're going to use the return from OpenAI so this is the return object and we're going to find the return and it actually comes in the message content so that's where our return data that we want to use lives and I'm just going to hit OK now if we run this once you will see the scenario is running and we're just waiting for it to essentially complete okay so amazing that scenario run was now complete and if you're looking here the description was generated this is looking good are based on the property name stunning one bedroom and standpoint tower with one bedroom one bathroom the view is a city view and the address is flat 109 standpoint tower this is the description that was generated okay i'm just going to maybe move that and i'm going to make this wrap over each other so we can read the whole thing the stunning one bedroom and standpoint tower oozes luxury with its spacious layout, alluring city view and modern decor. This property located at flat 109 boasts one bedroom and one bathroom. It's nestled in the heart of downtown Dubai, so this is where it gets good. A vivacious district known for its high-end dining and shopping options. So that's good. I feel like OpenAI really found out about downtown Dubai. It also says the property is conveniently minuted away from landmarks like the Burj Khalifa and Dubai Mall. So again, it's used AI in order to probably look on a map and figure out what is close to our property. And those are the landmarks it returned. We also have glorious architectural sites of downtown Dubai, a less than 15 minutes walk from the metro station. So we know it's close to a metro station, making it easy to explore the fascinating cityscape. I mean, this is wonderful. I'm so happy with this. And of course, every time we add a new line, we'll just run it. And another description will be generated for us thanks to our scenario, okay? So once that's finished running, again, you will see that has been generated pretty well, if I might add. Now, for those of you who cannot use ChatGPT4, this is important. So if you look in here, now that we've actually run the scenario, we actually kind of can see the object coming back to us and the data that comes back to the property name, so the values for each one. So under choices, message, we get the content, the cozy two bed in a zizi, the cozy two bed in a zizi, okay? So if you are struggling to know what to pick out the object, it could be a wise choice to run the scenario and then, you know, use the information in here. This is also important as if you cannot use ChatGPT4 for whatever reason and you need to use GPT 3.5, so for example, if I chose to create a prompt instead and the model I chose, uh, of course we can't have GPT-4, let's go with text DaVinci 003. The results won't be as good, but I'm just gonna show you. And then I'm just gonna paste in the same prompt. Okay, so exactly the same one. Click okay. Uh, and if we run this, this will not work, right? Because Okay, so we can see nothing's been added here. This is because the object that comes back is actually different. So when we're trying to put something in F, and we go to message content, so choices, message, content, there's nothing here. This is because with the method we chose, the returning text we need lives under choices text. So that's what I'd have to pick out, choices text, and that will now be filled out into here. So if I click OK and hit run, Ta-da, we've missed that one as that has already been, you know, officially ran, but we get this text right here. So this text is what is generating using the GPT 3.5 DaVinci model. It's not as good. In fact, I don't even know why it's this short, but you might have to tamper around with the prompt, okay? But that is just some extra information for you if you don't have access to GPT-4 or if you're watching this in the future and there's a completely different model, right, that has a completely different return object, okay? Great. 
So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully this also allows you to kind of debug things if you're getting stuck and have no idea what any of these values are. Um, for now, however, I'm just going to change it back. So let's just copy this again. Change this back to be create chat completion. Change the model of this to be GPT-4 again. Add an item, role, user, message content. Okay. And then once again, we just need to maybe let's run this so we know what comes back to us in the object. And I'm just going to delete all that. And this time we again need choices, message, content. Okay. And wonderful. And now if I just go ahead and maybe add a new line, let's just go ahead and copy this one here because it didn't really return anything for us. Let's run this. And amazing. We get a beautiful description coming back to us once more. And I'm just going to delete that one here. Maybe let's delete that whole row. Great. So this is looking wonderful. I'm super happy with this. Now you can schedule this. You can schedule it at regular intervals, run every 15 minutes and check if there is a new line added. You might want to do that. That just means you can go ahead and work on the spreadsheet as you wish, leaving the description blank and it should initiate every 15 minutes and just update the latest row once. So that is something you can do or you can do it once every day. You can schedule it for days of the week and so on. Okay, I'm just going to choose for it to be on demand for now so that we run this whenever we want. Great. So I hope this was kind of useful for you. I'm just going to show you the full thing once more. Amazing. Let's move on. In this section, I'm going to show you how to create an event ticketing system with Google Sheets, Google Docs and barcodes. That's right, no need for some fancy CRM. We're going to do all of this just with these simple tools and start selling tickets to events at scale with little to no teams behind us. Okay, so let's do it. Okay, so let's create a scenario. So I'm just going to go ahead and select here and I'm going to choose to call this scenario ticketing with barcode automation. Okay, so we are going to be using a Google Sheet with some information in order to create barcodes for tickets and then the tickets themselves. So let's go ahead and do this. First off, I'm just going to select the module that I want to start with. As mentioned, this is going to be a Google Sheet. So let's go ahead and search for Google Sheets. And here we are. Now we need to watch for new rows. So this is going to trigger when a new row is added. So let's just go ahead and add that and let's create a connection if you don't have one yet. So once again, if you have been following along with this tutorial, you should have a Google Sheet connection already established. But if you don't, here's how you do it. So we're going to create a connection. I'm just going to sign in with my Google account and it should bring up this little pop up right here in which I select my account. I'm going to choose Anya at code with Anya.com in order to access my Google account and allow Mick to see, edit, create and delete all of my Google Drive files. Okay, and especially the spreadsheets because that is what I want to essentially be able to interact with. So let's go ahead and allow that connection. Let's allow Mick to access those files. And now, well, I think we're going to have to create a file. So let's go ahead and do that. So of course, I'm already signed into my Google account. As you can see here, there is my Google account and its information. And if I click on Google Apps, I can select Google Sheets in order to create a new sheet. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to just select blank spreadsheet right here. And let's go ahead and name this something. As these are tickets, I'm just going to call this tickets. Okay, so just like so. And let's rename this sheet tickets as well. 
You can, of course, call it whatever you would like. Now we're going to have to have some rows here. So let's go ahead and name the columns for these rows. Let's start off with the ticket number being number one. And just like in real life, perhaps let's start with, let's not start with one as it might get confusing. I'm going to start off with ticket number 2201. Okay, so I'm just going to append 220 to all these tickets, 2202, 2203, 2204, 2005, okay? And next we're actually going to have the row in which that ticket uh, is assigned to. Let's go with row A, B, C, and then let's just go A, A. And finally, we're also going to have this seat number. So again, I'm just making these up. Right, this is just for demo purposes. And I've chosen rows to be letters, just again, so we can really see where that data is coming from. All of these columns have a kind of different format to them. Great, and of course you can, you know, style this up a little bit if you would wish, but you don't have to. Uh, this is just for demo purposes. I assume that if you have a spreadsheet where you track your ticket sales, you'd have much more information, such as the name of the ticket holder, perhaps even the timestamp, perhaps the price of the ticket. There is so, so much more you can add. But of course, for this tutorial, this is the bare minimum we're going to need. Great, so we have our spreadsheet made. So let's go ahead and search by path. Let's look at my drive and now let's click here to choose the file. So I'm just literally going to search for tickets. We can search for it up here. And there we go. So we've selected the spreadsheet ID. It is tickets. And now we also need to select the sheet, which I have named tickets. So I can just get it from the drop down like so. This does contain headers as we have added them here. So we just want to make that really obvious. So we ignore the headers row and great. Let's just go ahead and keep this as it is. You can change the range if you want. You know, you can change it to just go up to the number C, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to keep it as it is and hit OK. Wonderful. And I'm just going to select all and hit OK. Now that we've done that, like I said, we're going to use this information in order to create a ticket and a barcode. So let's start off with making the barcode first. I'm going to add another module here and let's just search for barcode simply like so. And there we go. And let's choose to generate a barcode. Now you can choose from many barcode types. I'm going to choose to keep it as a QR code. However, you can have so many others. Okay. So that is just something that you can do. Let's stick with QR code for now. The text of this is going to be the ticket number. Okay. Because I want the QR code to be named after the ticket number. So essentially after this. So the first car code should be 2001. And we can actually also change the file name of this to be 2001 PNG. So I'm just going to replace that like so. And now the file name will be 2001.pg or 2002.png of the barcode itself. And I'm just going to hit OK. Great. So now we've created that barcode, we actually need to do something with it and we're going to store it on my Google Drive. So once again, maybe let's go back to Google, so my Google account and go to my drive and I'm just going to create a folder in order to store these. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder and let's just call this barcodes for now and click create. So we have a folder called barcodes in here right now. So now that's where we want to put these barcodes, right? So let's go ahead and add another module. I'm going to now search for Google Drive this time and select Google Drive as that is where we want to store these files. And we're just going to upload a file. So let's select upload a file because once again, we've created a barcode or a PNG of a barcode, but we haven't really done much with it quite yet. So let's go ahead and create a connection once more. There's going to be a Google restricted connection and you might need to follow some external steps if you want to connect with a personal Google account. To do that, simply click on this guide. Okay, I'm not going to be doing it right now as these steps might vary in the future if you're watching this in the future. So I'm just going to go ahead and select 
sign in with Google. And once again, I'm just going to select my account, which is Anya at codewithania.com. And I'm going to allow this. Great. So that is giving access to my Google Drive to the Make app. Now, the folder that we want, we're going to actually select from a list and just make sure that my drive is selected and we're going to choose a folder. I'm going to choose the folder that I literally just named called barcodes. Okay. And the file I'm going to choose is barcodes. So just keep that selected and I'm just going to hit OK. So if we run this now, Okay, we will see this is running, this is running, and this is running, and that is now completed. The scenario run was completed. If I look in here, you will see a barcode, right? A barcode has been created, two have been created, so created this one and this one from my rows. This is looking great. So we have the barcodes. Next, let's actually work on putting them in a ticket, okay? And in order to do this, we're going to have to create a share link that will allow us to share this file to somewhere else. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm just going to move this over or perhaps maybe let's just minimize this slightly and move this like so and select here and add Google Drive again. So this time we need to get a share link. So I'm just going to get a share link right here. I've selected get a share link. And this time, again, we're going to look in my drive. We're going to look for a file. And next we're going to find the file ID. We can actually use it from the previous module, right? So if we look at all the modules here, that was the first module we did and it's return. The second module we did and it's return data. And the third module is the one we literally just did with Google Drive when we uploaded a file, and that's its return. So I'm going to choose file ID from here. So let's just go ahead and get that file ID. Because we ran this once, we do also get the returns of this data showing up here that is specific to its last run. OK, so that is kind of useful. You might want to keep running this in order to get that information just so you kind of know what you're working with a lot better. So let's go ahead and select the file ID. This is a unique file ID that will allow us to find files in Google Drive. So that's all I'm going to do. Let's keep the role as reader. The type I'm going to just select anyone just to make it a little bit more generic. And I'm just going to click OK. So now if I run this, we will get a share link to the file. So in other words, to this that was just created. OK, great. One more step to go. So the last step we need to do is actually create a ticket. And for this, I'm going to use Google Docs. So once again, let's go back in here, back to my Google account. And I'm just going to select Docs like so. And I'm going to create a blank document. You guessed it. And now I'm just going to create a ticket. So I'm going to call this dynamic barcode ticket and let's get creating. So I'm going to choose to obviously just do this in a super, super minimal way. You can choose to do this however you wish. I'm going to create a table for this. Let's give this six rows. Let's just type game one ticket. Let's also change the text to be a title perhaps. I'm going to change the font. Please go ahead and just do whatever you wish. I'm just kind of creating one that is super simple. Let's also add an emoji here. And perhaps maybe let's center all of this text. So I'm just going to highlight it all and center it. So there we have, I guess, the header of our ticket. Next, I'm just going to put some more information. But first, I'm going to split these cells out. So in order to do that, I'm going to format table split cell. Let's make it three columns and split and do the same for here. So format table split cells. Let's make three columns and split. 
here i think i'm just gonna have springfield bees okay so i'm essentially creating a fake basketball ticket versus and let's make another team scranton bears and again let's have some emojis so i'm going to put a little b and let's put a little bear let's also change this to be pacifico let's make it a lot bigger same for this one let's go pacifico perhaps let's put that on a new line again pacifico make that 36 we can put in a date here so let's just go somewhere in the future like 04 04 2025 7 p.m this is our fake game of course and let's make this again let's make this all pacifico let's go with 24 this one perhaps let's change to be size 14 maybe something a little bit more serious so i'm gonna go with that one again make it bold however so here what i'm gonna do in order to pick stuff out i'm gonna use these two curly braces and i'm going to find the row okay in fact maybe let's make this a little bit more serious too with roboto because we're going to be replacing that and once again, same for here. We're going to go with seat and we're going to pick this out in the document and replace it. Okay, so this is looking quite good. I'm just going to mess with this a little bit more. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Let's change this to size 24. I'm going to just put this on a new line. Maybe let's move it down a little bit. So I'm just going to change how this looks a little bit by adding some spacing just so that it looks like as if it's centered okay so again we're going to be replacing the row with the row from here and replacing the seat with the seat from here let's move on uh, let's have some generic text in here like all exits are final no re-entry is permitted and also camera flashes may not be used at any time during games okay so there we go and once again format align to the left and here we're essentially going to be putting in the barcode. So perhaps we don't even need this final row. Let's get rid of that. I'm just going to delete the row. Great. So this is where our barcode is essentially going to go. Let's just make that a little bit bigger. And I think this will look good. For now, I'm just going to paste in one just so we can see what it will potentially look like in the future. And perhaps I'm just going to also change the page borders in order to make this look nice. So I'm just going to move that up a little bit just so that it all fits nicely on one page. Okay, so just like that. So that is kind of the template for our ticket. Let's carry on. So in here, what I'm going to do is add another module, of course, and now let's search for Google Documents. So let's select Google Docs this time, and this time I'm going to create a document, but from a template. So it already tells you that if you want to replace any text, you need to use these tags. So the tags in the two curly braces. So this module will also allow you to replace images by new images with URLs. So that is something that we're going to do. We're just going to have to select an account. So I'm going to go ahead and select my Google connection. And let's just go ahead and update this because that is a requirement. So once again, just log in to your Google account and allow Make to access your Google account this time to see all your Google Docs documents too. So let's update that. So I'm just going to click allow and great. 
and we're going to select by drop down my drive and now let's find the file that we just created so dynamic barcode ticket okay and we're going to use that as a template we can now also change the title of the document itself so instead of having dynamic barcode ticket i could change it so i'm just going to put ticket number and we're going to use the ticket number from collapse all these from the google sheet we're just going to get the ticket number so just like so same as the row so once again i can go back to my google sheet and get the row to replace the row and as the seat we can just get the seat okay great we can even replace it with so for example if we want some text row like this and then the seat just so it's really obvious what is going on because that whole thing will be replaced so the word seat will not exist anymore or you could have seat here it is really up to you however you'd like to do it great next we need the image urls so in the body image number one well this time i'm just going to get the share link right because we made a url so we're going to get that share link now so let's get that share link like so if that does not work just make sure to change the share link here to the web content link instead Wonderful. And finally, once that ticket is made, let's put it somewhere. So I'm going to actually go back in here, go back to my drive and let's create a new one. So I'm going to create a new folder and call this tickets. Okay. And click create. So there we go. Let's double click on here and let's see the tickets show up. So now let's find it, right? We need to go into my drive and let's find that newly created folder called tickets. And this is essentially where I want to save my newly created documents from the template. So I'm just going to click OK. Wonderful. So let's go ahead and run this and let's see what happens. So, of course, we are now running this module, which has worked. We're creating a barcode, we're uploading the file, we're getting the share link, and finally we're creating a document from the template that we just made. So great, the scenario was initialized. Let's see if that's been created, and it has. Ticket number 2003, so this one right here. And if we click on it, you will see these have been updated. So we get row C, we get seat 36 as well being updated so row c seat 36 that is looking good and this barcode should be unique let's have a look here and it is because it's completely different to this one this is looking wonderful i'm really happy with this if you would like to increase the quality or the scale of the image all you could do is need to go to advanced options and you can change the scale. So for example, I can make it scale times 10. And if I click OK and run this once more, so once again, we're just waiting for the modules to complete. And now let's check in tickets to see the latest document that should be created. And that's ticket 2005. And if we double click on it, you will see the barcode is of a much bigger scale okay it just looks a lot more crisp and a lot more professional great hopefully you'll find some great uses for this uh, i love how many tickets you can create with this and in general it's just an awesome automation to have Now, while all the scenarios so far have been dealing with customers and clients in some way, this automation is more for dealing with your own colleagues or employees. I'm going to show you how to make some in-house automations. So let's do it. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new scenario. So let's go ahead and call this something. I'm going to call this events from Trello cards. Now, of course, we're going to have to start off with our first module and we're going to start off at Trello. So I already have a Trello account signed up too. I'm just going to go ahead and search for Trello in here. 
So here we have Trello and we are going to have to watch for cards. So let's scroll all the way down here and we're just going to select watch cards. Okay, so there we go. Now let's go ahead and create a connection. So let's go ahead and start that up. I'm going to go ahead and click save and it's just going to redirect me to give access to Trello. So it's already noticed that I have signed up using Anya with codewithanya.com. So all I'm going to do is click allow. Okay, and it's going to give access to my whole Trello board. So while that's doing its thing, I'm just going to go ahead and go to Trello to show you what I have there. Okay, so here is my Trello account and I'm going to go ahead and create a new board. I'm going to call this job I need to do and it's going to be a workspace. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. First off, let's go ahead and create a few lists. So maybe let's have a to-do list containing cards that I am yet to do. And then maybe let's have in progress and then let's have done. So this is just, again, just an example of a typical Trello board. And what I'm going to do is create cards that I'm going to essentially move from to do in progress until done. So you might see this being used in a developer setting. Perhaps you work for a startup and you have loads of tasks or tickets that need completing. So I'm going to pretend that we are a developer. OK, I am a developer or I'm working as part of a developer team and there's a card and this card says create button for new app and I'm just going to add that card. So this is one card we have just created. OK, and we can do many things with this card. We are going to have to, for the purpose of the tutorial, write a summary in here. So let's go ahead and write a summary, create a button for the new app that is aligned with the branding documents. OK, so that is one thing you're going to have to do for this tutorial, add a summary to the ticket. And the other thing you're going to have to do is add a date or in other words, a due date for this ticket. So let's go ahead and select the 18th of January 2024. I'm just going to keep the time the same and we can have a due date reminder. It is up to us and I'm just going to go ahead and save it. So we've just added a date, a due date to this ticket that is important. And let's just go ahead and save it. Of course, there are many, many other functionalities to Trello. You can add members, add labels, add a checklist. But this is not a Trello tutorial. This is a make.com tutorial. So I'm going to go ahead and shut that down for now. OK, so once again, if you create a ticket, just make sure that it has a summary or a description and a due date in order for our tutorial to work. Great. So now let's go back in here. We've created our Trello connections. I'm just going to watch for all cards in Trello, OK, just to make our lives a little bit easier. And I'm going to click OK. Now, if you wanted to be more specific, you can watch out for cards on a specific board only in which we would have to pick out the board. So the board I'm going to choose is jobs I need to do, as that is the one that we are working on here. So that is an option. Like I said, I'm just going to be more general for this tutorial and select all cards and click OK. And let's just go ahead and start from now. OK, great. The next thing we need to do is actually get that card. So I'm going to select Trello again and we're going to have to search for get a card. So here we go. And this essentially just returns a card back by its ID. And we're going to get that from the first Trello module and we're going to search for data card and under card, we're going to get the ID. OK. And that's all we're going to do. And finally, we have one more to do. So once we create a card, we're going to get the cards and we're just going to add an event on our Google Calendar. So we're going to have to search for that here. We're going to get the Google connection under the calendar. 
so Google Calendar, and all we're going to do is create an event. So first off, we have to create that connection. My Google connection is what I'm going to call it. I'm going to sign in with Google. Once again, you might already have this connection made. If you have already made a Google connection before, I'm going to make sure the account is Anya at codewithanya.com as that is the calendar, the Google calendar I want to use in order to get events to pop up. So let's go ahead and select that. And this will allow me to see, edit, share, and permanently delete all calendars you can access using Google Calendar. And I'm just going to click allow. So I'm giving access to make.com for that. And great, my Google connection is now done. Now we're going to create an event. Uh, we can do it quickly or in detail. I'm going to select to do it in detail. And now we're going to have to select the calendar. So this is the calendar associated with my Google Calendar here. I'm of course signed into Google and under calendars, you will see I have a few calendars here. I have mine here, birthdays and tasks. I'm just going to select to do this to Anya Kubo. So let's go ahead and find that calendar ID Anya at codewithanya.com and the event name. Well, the event name, we're going to get this from the actual card. So the Trello card right here that comes back with get a card. Make sure get a card is the one you're going for, not watch cards. So you can minimize that if you want and expand get a card. And we're going to get the description that we put in that card. So let's scroll down here to get the description. So once again, this is the description that we will be using for the event. Okay, great. Now down here, we're just also going to use the due date. So we're going to once again, get the badges due date and the end date. We're also going to get the badges due date. So that's all you're going to have to do and click OK. So that's really it. I think we should give this a go. So let's go back here. I'm just going to create a new one. Let's go ahead and call this add header to app. Create the card. Once again, we need to go in here and write down a description. Please create a header for the new app. We are building that aligns with the branding documentation. Let's also add a date, a due date. So let's go with January again, the 19th at 6.40. And I'm just going to hit save. Okay, great. So that should be done. This card has a due date. It has a description. So now if we run this, ta-da! Please create a header for the new app we are building that aligns with the branding documentation. Wonderful. And it's created at the right time, the exact same time that the due date was added. Super simple. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Another thing you can do, which is a fun one, is potentially write an automation that will link messages that someone sends on a particular Discord channel to a Google Sheet. So for example, in my own Discord channel that I have for codewithania.com, so this is where my community is, and I have a channel specifically for people asking requests to one of my GitHub repositories, which is private. It's a private repository that I have for people who are paying to take my course. So I could potentially get an automation that will listen out for specific messages on a channel. So here we can do it. I'm going to go ahead and set this up now. So if I create a scenario here, uh, and then the first thing we're going to choose is of course Discord. So please go ahead and select Discord as well. And we're going to watch channel messages. So this one right here, that's the one that I'm going to choose. And of course we need to create a connection. So this is my Discord channel. Okay, I've just headed over to discord.com. I already have signed up to this, but you know the drill. If you haven't signed up to use Discord before, then please go ahead and sign up. It is for free. I'm just gonna go ahead and open up my Discord. 
So this is my Discord right here. I actually am a member of many channels, but the code with Anya.com one is one that I own. So I'm going to show you this with a completely new channel so that you can do the same. But essentially what I'd like to do is get anyone who wants GitHub access and messages on here to be put in a spreadsheet for me. So let's do it. I'm just going to go down here and let's go ahead and create a new server. So I'm going to go ahead and create my own. This is going to be for a club or community. And let's just call this demo server just like the and click create. So here is my demo server. Of course, at the moment, there is no one here at all. You can invite people to it. You get this cool little link right here. And then you can also edit the link so that it doesn't expire in seven days. You can make it either shorter or that it never expires. So that is something that you can do. Great. So this is my demo server right here. And all I'm going to do is create a channel. So I'm going to create a channel and let's call this access request and I'm going to create a channel. So here we are. That is my channel. And essentially, if I want to, you know, say something like, please write your email here if you would like access to my private git hub repository. Okay, and then I can write that I can even pin it. So for example, pin message like so Oh yeah, pin it. So that will always remain kind of at the top. So great, we have a channel. And now let's create a spreadsheet. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go here and I'm just going to create a spreadsheet like so. So select spreadsheet and let's create a blank spreadsheet. So let's go ahead and call this GitHub requests. And here I can have the email of the person who is making the request. So which email I need to give access to. And then I can have a column here just for me. Uh, so permitted. OK, and we'll just put yes or no. So once again, this is super basic. This is something that I think could be quite useful. I can really be developed further as well. So there we go. I'm just making it a little bit prettier for you. So great, we have our Google document. We have our Discord channel. Let's do it. Let's create a connection. So you're going to have to give Integromat access to the Discord channel. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Please do the same. This pop up should show up and you can select the server. We know that we want it to be the demo server. So make sure that that one is selected and just click continue. And I'm just going to give access to all of this. Of course, you don't have to if you don't want to. That part is up to you. Before this tutorial, I'm going to do it. And yes, I am human. So great. That has now done its thing. I'm now going to select the channel ID and it's access request. That's the channel we want to watch and we can limit it to two per go. Uh, that part again is going to be up to you. This just means if you run this and there's more than two access requests in there, it will stop at two. So if you want, you can make it 10 or you can just make it one each time that you run it again up to you. I'm going to go ahead and do from now on and just click OK. Now let's go ahead and connect this Google Sheet. So I'm going to go ahead and add another module and let's search for Google Sheets. So just select that one and we are going to essentially add a row this time. So go ahead and add a row. Make sure that this is connected if you don't have your connection set up. And then we're just going to find the spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet we know is called GitHub requests. So I'm going to search for GitHub requests like this. And then I'm just going to go down here and find the sheet name is is sheet one because sheet one is what we called it here. We just give it the default naming. And now we do have a table header. So that is going to stay as it is. And we can map out the values. So I'm going to get up the object, the whole object that comes back from Discord. As you can see, there is so, so much here. You get information about the author, like its username. You can even get the avatar, 
the timestamp of the message, and so much more, the channel ID. There really is a lot to play around with. For now though, we're just gonna get the content, okay? So that's all we're gonna do, and then I'm just going to essentially go back to Discord, and let's just add an email address that I would like to give GitHub access to, okay? So the email, of course, you might like to, you know, specify like I did that you need to write email because essentially any message will get sent. So that is just something that you're gonna have to figure out. So here is my message that I wanna send over to here to be sent here and saved under this column. So let's just send that. And now I'm gonna run this and we can look back in here and Anya at code with Anya.com was added. And then I can, whenever I get around to it, say that this was given permission to, or leave it blank for not yet. So that is something that I can fill in manually. This is just an organizational tool. If I wanted to build this up more, of course I can. So let's go ahead and do that now. I'm gonna insert two more columns to the left. I can also include the username of the user. I'm just gonna delete this for now. Let's turn this back to be yellow. Let's also choose to add a bottom border to this. And maybe let's also add the timestamp of the request, just so we know when this request came in. So let's go ahead and try this again. This just means I need to go back to here and we just need to adjust what we need to save to this spreadsheet. So under email, we are getting this. However, we do need to refresh this to get the latest columns of the table. So that's what that refresh button is for. Any changes will now be shown. So there we go, we've done it. The username now shows up first, then the timestamp, then the email, and then permitted. So just like here, username, timestamp, email, and permitted. This is looking great. But of course we don't want content from here and because we did run this once, we're actually getting back all the data that is to our disposal. So this is great. So now let's go ahead and use the username, which is author username, so I can select that. The timestamp, there's an edited timestamp, but we don't want that, we just want the timestamp. And the email address, well that's just gonna be the content once more, so let's select the content. So that is now what I want to show up in my Google Sheet. We're just getting a little bit more data from Discord, essentially. So let's go ahead and click OK. So we've now saved that. Let's go back here. I'm just going to paste this once more. So just pretend this is a fresh new email and hit Enter. And now let's run this once more as new data has come in. And now if we look in here, ta-da, we get the username. Is this my user Discord name? Well, let's check it out. Yes, it is. That is looking cool. Uh, we could have grabbed my avatar. We could have grabbed all this information, but we didn't. We also got the timestamp. So this is exactly the timestamp where we got this message at. And then we also get the email address. So the content of the message. And then when I get around to it, I can fill this out, whether I've given GitHub access to this user or not, simply by going yes, uh, or just leaving it blank if I haven't yet. So great, I hope this tool was useful for you. Perhaps you can think of some good use cases for this, for managing your clients, for managing maybe leads as well. Perhaps you wanna sell access to your GitHub repository. Uh, I don't know, that is up to you. Then again, then you can add something uh, more like a sales funnel. So for example, payment, link sent, paid, and so on. Again, this part is completely up to you. This is more of a business question that you could probably answer yourself. So great, this is looking good. Now, one thing you might have noticed is that the format of this timestamp isn't exactly great. It's not very readable. Now, you can go ahead and change it in here, but why when you can change it on make.com itself and send over your intended format from here, so from the get-go? So you can do this. I'm just gonna show you this now. 
Let's just work with the timestamp. So let's get rid of these two things right here. And if you go ahead and select the input, you will see all these other tabs as well. So these are showing up. Let's go into them. So if I select on the general functions, you will see some general functions that are available to you. And if you hover over them, it will also give you an explanation and an example of what this function is used for. We also have some operators and keywords that are applicable to coding as well. So booleans, so you can essentially write code such as if this is true, then that, and so on. We also have math functions, so these are great for working with numbers where you can either round down numbers using math floor, you can pass numbers, you can get the max and min of numbers, you can get the sum of numbers and even round numbers as well. So once again, here we have an explanation and we also have some examples. So for example, if you pass through 1.2, through the round function, you will get one and so on. It is rounding the numbers. We also have operators with numbers. So you can add two numbers together, divide the numbers and so on. Okay. Once again, if you click on them or if you hover them, you will get a description of what these do. We also have functions and keywords for text. So I'm going to show you this right now with the timestamp. You might not really want to use this for the timestamp, but I think let's just give it a go and you can apply this function when you need. So for example, the function length, I've just hovered over it and seen that the function length takes a string of hello and tells us exactly how many characters are in it. So let's try it out. I just clicked on the function and now all I'm going to do is get this right here and whack it through like that. So now let's hit OK and then let's go ahead and add another email again and send it. And now let's run this. So now if I go back here, 32 is what comes back, not the timestamp anymore, the number 32, because 32 characters exist in the timestamp and we pass that timestamp through the function of length. So that is my return value. Great. So now let's carry on. Of course, this is not useful for timestamps. We want to format the timestamp. So I'm just going to get rid of that wrapping function. Let's get back the timestamp. So there it is. And now let's go to the dates. So the date and time is exactly what I would need. Here are my variables and we're going to format the date. So if you hover over format date, you can essentially see what the return will come back with. This says it returns a date in the request of format and optionally in a specific time zone. So for example, we can set the format to be day, day, month, month, year, 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 and then the time. So let's go ahead and try one of these out. So if I want to set the date to be month, day, year, we do kind of also want the time, however. So I think maybe let's go with this one right here. So let's just go ahead and copy that. We put the time step through first, then we put this. So let's move the timestamp here. Okay, so in between this semicolon, then we're going to do day, day, month, month, year, year, year. Let's also have the hour, minute, and then so just like so, then we can also even add the time zone. So Europe, Prague, if we wish. So let's just go ahead and copy Europe, Prague. Okay. And let's just hit. Okay. So now once more, let's just copy this, hit enter and run this like so. And ta-da, we get the day, month, year, the time in a specific time zone, which is Europe, Prague. This is correct because I'm currently in Dubai and Europe, Prague is three hours behind me. Great. I'm happy with this. Okay. So hopefully you can have a look at some more of these as well. We also have functions for working with arrays. That is something that I didn't show previously where you have the functions to join. You can get the length of items in the array. You can slice the array. So these are very, you know, JavaScript based functions. And you can also write your own custom and system variables as well.
So a lot to play around with. I hope you have fun. In this section, we will start off easy with automating responses to incoming emails. We will set up a scenario that listens out to when we get an email into our Gmail account. Then we will use the OpenAI API in order to categorize what kind of email it is. Is it a request for help or is it a complaint, for example? Once we know that, we will use our Google Sheet in order to decide what kind of response we want to give the email sender based on a template that we will write for the category. We will then feed all this information back to OpenAI so that a unique and personalized email can be drafted for us in Gmail. Looks good, right? Okay, so what are we waiting for? Let's do it. Okay, so let's go ahead and create another scenario. So I'm just going to click here and this scenario is going to be to automate responses to emails. So let's go ahead and name the scenario. I'm going to call this automate responses to emails using chat GPT. And we're going to have to choose where you want to start off. Well, of course, we want to start off with watching out for emails that come in into our email address. So I'm just going to go ahead and search for mail here. So there it is. And we're going to watch for emails. So just select that one. Now we're going to have to create a connection. So let's go ahead and click on here. And the connection type we're going to use is Google restricted. This is because I'm going to be linking up a Gmail account. So I'm going to be selecting this one and show you the instructions in order to do it with a Gmail account. However, if you want to try another email, please go ahead and choose from the ones below. And if you get stuck, please refer to the make.com documentations. So let's go ahead and choose Google Restricted. I'm going to name this my Google Restricted Connection, just like so. And if you are having trouble with this, there are some resources here in order to help you. Okay. Great. Now, if you are using a personal Google account and not a work one like me, you're going to have to follow this guide right here. This might be updated at time of reading. So just make sure to follow it through with the correct instructions. Okay, great. So I'm going to choose to save this. This should open up this pop up for me in which I'm going to choose my email address that I want the inbox to connect to. And I'm just going to allow make to essentially read, compose, send and permanently delete all my emails from Anya at codewithania.com. Great. Now here on the now here under folders, I'm going to choose to target the inbox, meaning that it is the inbox of my email account. Okay, just the generic inbox. And I can also choose a criteria for it to automatically respond to all unread emails. Okay, so only if the email is unread, do I want to create an email response for it. We can do other stuff as in target only emails sent from a specific email address. We are not going to do that as well as subjects and so on. Okay, so if you want to target emails with a specific subject, we can only respond to those or even emails containing a specific phrase. We're going to leave the mark message as read as no, as to not interfere with my inbox. And we're going to leave the maximum number of results as one as well. Wonderful. So that is now done. And let's just go with from now on. So we're going to create a response from any email sent to Anya at codewithanya.com as of now. Okay, wonderful. Now I'm going to add a connection. So I'm going to add another module and this is going to be to open AI and we're going to create a completion. So we are using the OpenAI Create Completion in order for us to essentially categorize the kind of email that's coming in so we know how to deal with it. So in order to do that, we of course have to create a connection. So I'm going to create a connection. I'm going to call it my OpenAI connection. If you have followed along to previous videos in this tutorial, you will already have one here, but I'm starting completely from scratch so we can do this together. 
So I'm going to name my OpenAI connection my OpenAI connection. And then this just means I need to head over to OpenAI in order to get my API key and my organization ID in order to communicate with OpenAI. I do have a paid account, so that is something you must keep in mind. You must add some funds to your account for OpenAI in order to be able to use it the way I'm going to be using it today. So let's head over to OpenAI. Right here, all I'm going to do is log in. So I've already signed up to OpenAI and we want to communicate with it via the API. Once here, I'm simply going to get my API key. I'm going to create a new key. Let's call it test and create a secret key. Now, please keep this safe as if someone takes this and uses it in their own project, they could potentially rack up lots and lots on your credit card. OK, and use up all your tokens. So just keep that safe. So all I'm going to do is copy this. Don't worry, I will be removing it so you can't use it in the future by simply deleting it like so and revoking the key. So if you need to do the same, just click on the revoke key button right here. Great. So the API key, I'm just going to paste in here and now we need to get the organization ID. So in order to do that, I can simply go to settings and I'm just going to copy this like so. And then let's go back in here and just paste it and save. So we've just created an open AI connection and now we're going to select a method. The method we're going to choose is create a chat completion and the model. Please go ahead and use the latest model that you can. I'm going to go ahead and select GPT-4 for this tutorial as that is the most up to date one at the time of creating this tutorial for me. Now we're going to have to write a message and we're going to have to select a role. I'm going to go with user and we're going to essentially ask OpenAI to categorize the email that's come in. So in order to do this, I'm going to literally write a prompt categorize the following the following email and then in quotation marks. So just like so in here, I'm going to get the text content of the email so we can get this from the essentially the response that comes back from email from the email module. And I'm simply just going to choose to pick the text content. So that's what I'm going to put in there, which means that anything we write in the email will be input into here. So as text in here. So, for example, if we get an incoming email to Anya at codewithania.com that says, what is my password in the body of the text? This will essentially put that in the prompt and the prompt will read categorize the following email and then in quotation marks, it will say, what is my password? And then we're going to essentially ask it to categorize the following email containing what is my password into one of these categories. OK, and the categories are going to be inquiry or requests or complaints and issues. Now, you can choose more categories if you want the email to be more specific based on each one. But for demo purposes, I'm just going to choose these two and I'm just going to hit OK. So there we go. We've done it. We'll get an email and then should be categorized into the two categories, one being inquiry and requests and two being complaints and issues. Great. Now, what do we want to do next? Well, we want to provide an email template based on if it's one of the two categories. So let's do it. And this data will be held in a Google Sheet. So I'm going to go ahead and add another module. So let's go ahead and find Google Sheets here from the drop down. And we're just going to search rows. So let's go ahead and select search rows. And before we do that, we're going to create a connection, but not before actually creating the Google Sheet first. So in order to do this, I can essentially just get up my Google Sheets. So if we go here, 
I am of course logged into Google so I can just simply click on here and select on sheets and then let's name this sheet something so I've just created a blank Google sheet which I'm going to name responses and in here we're going to create a column called category and then we're also going to create a column called prompt and we're essentially going to provide a prompt based on what kind of category the email belongs to. So like I said, the first one is inquiry or requests. And the second one is going to be complaints and issues. Okay, so those are the two categories that we discussed. Of course, you can make this look as nice as you wish by kind of styling this up slightly so just like so. And once again, this is the first category and this is the second category. And the first prompt that we want to write for if an email is an inquiry request is going to be the following. So I'm just going to paste this in like so because we can essentially go through it together. So in quotation marks, I've essentially written a prompt to give OpenAI if the email received is an inquiry or request and the prompt reads, provide an email reply to this inquiry request with all the relevant information that has been requested. Use this email sample as context when drafting your reply. So we are essentially teaching OpenAI how we want our response to look. Uh, it's going to have a subject, re-request for technical support. And if the customer's name is, you know, detectable, we'll put dear customer's name. And again, this is just a suggestion to OpenAI. So the suggestion we have given is thank you for contacting our technical support team about the issue you're experiencing with product or service name. We understand how important it is for you to have a seamless experience and we're here to assist you in resolving this issue promptly. Based on your description, it appears that the problem may have been caused by, and then we insert the possible cause, and then we also say, in order to troubleshoot and resolve this issue, please follow these steps. And we want three steps to be given. Once you've completed these steps, please restart your device and check if the issue has been resolved. If you're still experiencing difficulties, please do not hesitate to contact us again. You can reach us through email, live chat, or by the phone, and then we give a phone number, or our technical support team is available day and hours of operation to provide you with the utmost assistance. We appreciate your patience as we work together to resolve this issue and thank you for choosing our company. Best regards, technical support specialist. This is the email. Okay, so I'm going to show you how this works. This is great, for example, if someone emails in saying they are having trouble with their password or something more advanced, but we will see that in action. Next, let's also provide a prompt for if there's a complaint or issue. So once again, I'm just going to paste this in like so. Okay, so that is the whole thing you will see in a cell by itself. So that is one cell and this is another cell. So in quotation marks, I'm just going to put provide an email reply to this complaint issue with all the relevant information that has been requested. Use this email sample as context when drafting your reply. And again, we're going to have a subject, complaint or issue. Dear customer, if a customer name exists, thank you for contacting our complaints team about the issue you're experiencing with and then the product or service name. We are sorry your experience hasn't been smooth so far. Is there anything we can do to help with the issue? Best regards, technical support specialist. Or we can even put complaints specialist to train it a bit more specifically for if the email is a complaint or issue. Great. So this is looking good. Let's go ahead and name this as responses. I don't know why that didn't save. And let's also name the sheet. So I'm going to rename this to templates. Okay. So just like that. And now back in here, let's go ahead and create a connection. So I'm going to select this and let's name this my Google connection. This is the first time or to be more specific, I'm acting as if this is the first time I am creating a Google connection and I'm just going to have to sign in with Google. So once again, we get a little pop up. I'm going to select my Gmail account, which is Anya at codewithania.com. And this will allow Mick to see, edit or create or delete all my Google Drive files as well as see, edit, create and delete all my Google Sheets spreadsheets. 
So I'm happy with that. So I'm just going to click allow. Wonderful. OK, great. And now once that connection has been established, I can essentially select from my drive and then I find the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet I named responses and then I'm going to find the sheet name, which is templates, correct? Because that is what we call the sheet down here. This table does contain headers, so that is correct. And this time we're going to filter. So I'm going to choose category because we're going to filter the category and we're going to get the text operates equal to, let's make it case insensitive. And then we're going to go with choices, message, content. And let's also keep the order ascending and that is looking good. OK, so once again, this is just the response that's going to come back from OpenAI. So once OpenAI has created a response and that is in deciding if the email belongs to inquiry requests or complaints issues. It's again, let's just make sure that we know what we're talking about. So here we essentially want it to match inquiry requests or complaints issues, right? So one of these, then we know which email template we're going to use. So let's go ahead and press OK on that and wonderful. So this is looking good. Now that we know if our email that's coming in is either going to use this template or this template, we need to send it back to OpenAI in order to make up a unique response based on the template. So I'm going to once again use OpenAI as my module and we're going to create a completion. Let's go ahead and select GPT-4, add a message. The role of this is going to be the user and the message content. Well, it's simply going to be the prompt. So the prompt, which is this column. And we're also going to send over the text content from the email. So text content. Wonderful. And let's click OK. So this is being built out. We've already got four modules here. We have one more to go, and that is to create a draft in our email address. So I'm going to go ahead and select this, select email, and we're going to create a draft email email address. It's the same email address, so Anya at codewithanya.com. So it's the same Google connection as the Google restricted connection. However, this time I'm going to put this in drafts. So let's go ahead and check the folders that I have existing in that email address. Let's go with drafts and let's add an email recipient. I'm just going to make a fake one. So John at example. Dot com as we don't really want to send this anywhere. We just want to make a draft the subject. Well, this is going to be the subject from the email that came in. So let's go ahead and select subject. You will see this is pulsating. So we know which module this is coming from. Great. The content type I'm just going to keep as HTML and the content is going to say hi. And then we're going to get the choices message content. OK, so that is from the latest OpenAI response that we got. Wonderful. So let's click OK and let's run it. So I'm just going to go head over to my actual email. There is currently no drafts in here. That is good because our automation hasn't created any. And I'm just going to compose an email to this email address. So I'm going to go to Anya at codewithania.com. So that draft has now been added. The subject is going to be my password is not working. And then I'm just going to pretend to be someone else. Hello, I have tried putting in my password numerous times and it has not worked. What should I do? Please advise. Okay, and let's just say this is from Danny Doyle. 
okay so Danny Doyle just imagine Danny Doyle is sending an email to Ania at codewithania.com the subject is my password is not working and this is the body of the email and I'm just going to send it so at the moment that is sent this is being sent to Ania at code with Ania so let's go ahead and run this so I'm gonna go ahead and run this like so the scenario is now initialized and you will see it progressing slowly and slowly until it hits this section right here okay and finally that email was created so the scenario one was complete and this just means that everything went through smoothly let's have a look in here and ta-da a draft was created in my email address let's have a look at what chat gpt came up with so like i said john at example.com was used as the email address the subject is simply the subject that i wrote in the email to ania at code with ania.com as we also said and here's what chat gpt came back with so here we go here is the subject the subject regarding password issue dear mr doyle thank you for reaching out to our support team with your concern and I'm sorry to hear about the issue you're facing with your password. In order to assist you better, could you please try the following steps to resolve this? One, ensure your caps lock is not turned on. Two, verify if you are entering the correct username associated with the account. And three, clear your browser cache and then try again. Four is try resetting your password. If you need instructions on how to do this, please let us know. If these steps don't solve the issue, please revert back so we can take more drastic measures such as resetting your password from our end. We are committed to ensuring that your experience with our service is seamless and hassle-free. We appreciate your patience and understanding in this matter and are always here to assist you. Best regards. And then, you know, if I'm happy with this, perhaps we don't need the high here. I would, of course, maybe format this a little bit more and put my name in here, Ania Kubo, Complaint Specialist. And if I'm happy with that, I mean, that really saved me so, so much time in regards to writing an email. Okay, so thank you, chat GPT. This is looking good. And I'd go ahead and send it if I'm happy with it. So there we go. Of course, you might even want to format this a little bit better, but this is essentially super, super ready to go. I mean, I don't think I would have been able to write this better myself. right pretty cool if you ask me okay so shall we perhaps try another one so i'm just gonna uh minimize that and perhaps let's try write a complaint so before we do that i'm just gonna get rid of this high right here and click OK. So please feel free to, you know, perfect this, tweak it as you wish. Perhaps for the subject, you might want something else. You can choose from literally all the returns of the modules that are due your disposal. Once you have run this once, you will even see the return of what's coming back. OK, so you can use that too. This might be quite good to run if you are a bit stuck, just so you can see what you have to work with. Okay, great. So, like I said, let's try another one. Let's try and make a complaint to Ania at Code with Ania. Let's pretend to be Becky Boo. The subject is I don't like your platform. I am sorry, but I I'm not a fan of your platform. I think the colors are too bright. Can you tell your UI team this as well as your branding team? Thanks. It's an odd complaint, but you know, I can't really think of anything else to complain about. So let's go ahead and try it. So once again, I am sending an email to Anya at codewithanya.com. I'm pretending to be Becky Boo. The subject is, I don't like your platform. And this is essentially the body of the email. So let's go ahead and send that. So that is now sent. 
And now if I run this scenario once more, so let's go ahead and run it and you will see these steps working. So there we go, they are slowly working. You will even see a little timer going off until all of it is complete. You will see the scenario run was successful. So great. So now if we go back here, hopefully this has recognized that this is a complaint. So the complaint category should be triggered in order to use this as a template. And amazing, I don't like your platform. Of course, there's a spelling mistake there. I don't like your platform. And then what has ChatGPT suggested as a response? Subject read feedback on platform design. Dear Miss Becky, Thank you for taking the time to give us your feedback on the visual design of our platform. We appreciate your honesty and take your opinions seriously. We understand that the color scheme of our platform may not be to everyone's liking. Our UI and branding team strive to design a platform that balances the aesthetic appeal and usability in the best way possible. That being said, we assure you that your feedback will be shared with both our UI and branding teams. We are constantly making improvements based on the feedback we receive from our users like you. Your comfort and satisfaction are of our utmost importance to us. After all, without losers like you, we wouldn't be here. Once again, thank you for bringing this matter to our attention. If there is anything else you wish to share or any other way we could assist you, please do not hesitate to let us know. Best regards, and once again, I would just put Anya Kubo. This time, I'm a complaints specialist. Okay, and then I would just hit send. So once again, how much time saved is that? That's pretty amazing. If you're feeling more bold, you might even want to put the email address of the user in here. But you know, I'd probably refrain from doing that unless you press send by mistake and you haven't checked what chat GPT has essentially written for you. Okay, so great. Once again, if you do want that email address in here instead, you would simply scroll down and find who this came from. This did come from Anya at codewithanya.com as the sender. So you would just replace that like so and hit OK. OK, wonderful. So I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. I think this is a great one to use. If you tweak it to your liking, it could be so, so incredible for your business. Okay, so I hope you found this course useful. Once again, here is a recap of everything that we have covered in this extensive automation course. I hope to see you again in the future on the Free Quick Camp channel.